Welcome guys, welcome to Flutter Day India. This is Yash Shadukar from Flutter Day India team. First of all, I would like to give my best wishes on our, to our audience on behalf of whole Flutter Day India team. So moving ahead to Flutter Day India. So what exactly is Flutter Day India? So Flutter Day India is a three hour conference organized by Flutter India communities. Now, what is going to happen actually in Flutter Day India? So in Flutter Day India, we are going to have some amazing speakers who are going to give some sessions and going to tell us about the new updates that we are having in Flutter. So now the question comes is what exactly is Flutter India? So Flutter India. So a lot of communities from okay. so a lot of communities across the across India have come together and we all have formed Flutter India community. So in this community we have kind of we have formed a YouTube channel where we host conferences, workshops, conferences, workshops and many more. So first I would like to welcome our guest speaker, none other than Ms. Nilayana for a session. All right, hello everyone. Hello, um, Nilay. Hi, hello, Nilay. I am trying to keep Cookie with me here. <laughs> you can see it. So you're gonna want to see Cookie. Cookie, say hi. Hello, Cookie. Say hello, hi. Cookie. <laughs> All right, sorry about my background, but this is the only place I can keep Cookie. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, I'm so excited. I saw the special guest poster today for Cookie, and I was like, I keep saying Cookie all day. We're gonna go to India tonight, and then yeah, Cookie is so excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, Cookie makes me really excited. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Yes, hi Cookie. Say Cookie, say hi. Hey, Cookie. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, okay, one, one second, I'll just, uh, so you can see me too. So, hello everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm so excited. My name is Eli. And um, so, I work, in, I work in the Flutter Developer Relations team at Google. And uh, today, as you know, yesterday we celebrated Flutter Day. And today here we are at Flutter Day uh, India. And I, first of all, I want to thank all the organizers for putting together this event. And yeah, hello everyone, I see your messages. Cookie is so excited. So as you know, Flutter is a young technology for Google, right? So, and there is a team, they are building Flutter and there is developer relations team. We are trying to create resources so you can learn about Flutter. But actually, Flutter's beauty is coming from its community, like from you, from you people. So thank you again for organizing this event. Thank you uh, giving talks. Thank you building apps. Thank you helping others. Thank you creating blogs, videos, and everything, because this is really valuable. And believe me, uh, all Flutter team is very aware of all the things you, you are doing. And we are, we, we are so thankful for all the things you do. And um, so that that's it from me and Cookie for tonight. So I wish you a great day today. Uh, thank you, Nile. Thanks for the awesome introduction, and thanks a lot for bringing Cookie here. I think everyone is so excited to meet uh, Cookie. Uh, thanks a lot, Nile. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have fun. Nice Have a nice bye. day. Cookie says bye. <laughs> bye, Cookie. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. So thank you, Nilay, for coming on stage. So now I'd like to call uh, hey, Aditya Sutak for the next sessions. Yeah, hello, guys. I'm Aditya from Flutter India team. So thank you, Nilay and Cookie, for uh, 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 like uh, coming on the stream. Uh, so moving forward to the today's keynote, we have uh, Vivek Yadav, Preet, and Sayan Mondal. Uh, Vivek, uh, Vivek Yadav and Preet from Flutter Mumbai they, uh, and uh, Sayan Mondal from uh, Flutter Kolkata. So uh, let's uh, move forward to keynote. All right, so. Uh, hello everybody, I guess. I hope you're having a beautiful morning this Saturday. Hello uh, everyone. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Everyone. Yeah. So let me just tell you what we're gonna do this 15 to 25 minutes right now before we get Andrew Bogdan for a Q and A session. 
So what we're going to do, as we usually do in real life meetups, which we can't attend right now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a small percolating conversation where us three discuss uh, things about Flutter, things that we've enjoyed, things that we do every day. And yeah, so, but before we dive into that, uh, if you have any questions for Andrew specifically, just drop them in the chat right now and the team will pick them up and then make sure to ask it to Andrew. Okay, so let me start with the first most interesting thing that most of us like to talk about. We love to talk about state management. Like everybody in the Flutter universe is a fanatic about state management. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna ask each one of these people and I'm gonna ask them what techniques they use, why they use it, why they like it. And if let's say somebody's going to try that out today, what's the one thing that, you know, they should absolutely know about that. So off to you, Sayan. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Preet, for asking me that. Like uh, state management is something which is pretty controversial, I'd say. So you have different opinions basically. So it's mostly about developers opinion, but what I personally prefer is uh, somewhere like a mix of provider and a block. Now, I'll give you the reason why I like that, because with providers, you get a lot of mutability, like options of mutability. So it's pretty easy than if you compare it with block, uh, like you, you provide and then you can actually with the mutability option, you get the flexibility to change anything from the UI, which is something which I am not a fan of. But with block, actually, it's quite restricted and structured. So it's like if you're going for a big app, which would require a lot of business logic and you would want to manipulate states but keep it restricted at the same time so if you want more control then i i, I would suggest that you go for block but then again it uh, brings a lot of boilerplate into the whole thing like in your whole application so that's also something which i don't recommend so i kind of switch between providers and blocks but then again you have something which is called as a state notifier which is a mix of both the providers and blocks. So definitely check it out. I haven't, I, I, I know about state, Pro state notify, but I haven't tried it personally, but it's also written by the author of provider. So you get best of both worlds actually. So you have the immutability from block, but you have the easiness from provider. So that's, you should definitely check it out. So for someone coming into the state management world, I would say know about block, but try provider and go into state notify and see if that works out for you. What about you, Vivek? So I personally like uh, block because uh, it was a very hard way to learn block actually. So I'll tell you, uh, you know, basics of the state management. So there is a machine known as a provider or you can say a block provider in my case, so which actually takes an event and emits out a state. So event is something you tell our machine, hey, hi, hey, hi I want to do this and then machine do something. After that, it emits you states. So it, uh, on the basis of state, you have to change your screen. So this was a basic thing which I learned in a very hard way. And I'll say it took me a, a week actually to learn about this. Okay. So this is a very basic thing. If you have, I mean, if you cleared this basic, basic thing, you can actually work with block or provider, uh, even mob X and everything. Okay. Why I like block uh, is there are reasons because block provide a very specific thing which we have to use. Uh, provider have very uh, a lot of things so sometimes uh, we get confused uh, about what to use and what not to use so basically block have a very beautiful thing known as condition so what it does it lets me to put a condition on states like which state i have to give to my screen so now i can control states and uh, and apart from there is a block listener so what it does uh, so for example on particular particular state I have to show some dialogue so what I can do I can use a block listener and I, mean, I can listen for the state and on the fly I can actually show some dialogue and show some snack uh, snack bars without having any error or I can say the red danger color screen okay so yeah that that that's it uh, for block for me and apart right. from that apart from that you can you uh, I mean I use value notifier for small small things because we cannot use block everywhere. Block is too heavy to use. I mean, it can uh, make your app performant and it can degrade your performance also. So you have to be careful. All right. There's so something I, called as driver pod, right? Well, which Pete has been trying out. Yeah, I've been trying that out. So yeah, so my turn right now. So what I'm, <laughs> so I, I'm a pretty big fan of providers essentially, just because of one reason. It allows 
it it really binds to the widgetry and it allows you know to have your state be part of the widgetry rather than block which which essentially business logic means you're actually separating out a business logic from your uh, widgetry widget ui components so i'm a fan of providers because it allows you to easily uh, make things make uis with data but i've been trying out riverpod since the last 2 3 days since you know remy announced it on twitter this week and what it brings to the table is easily mixing and matching providers so like right now the problem and no, not really a problem you can achieve it but if you want to say mix five different providers which would which would spin up using different things it is a bit complex and now see you wouldn't want to mix five providers but uh, but the thing is right now you can't with riverpod you have the ability to you know mix and match as you like and you know like mix uh, just make your uh, just pass your just make your ui so more that's dynamic. again because of hooks right flutter hooks yeah so yeah so uh, riverpod wouldn't exist without flutter hooks so like in in the end so like i've seen the core like i've tried to look at the source code of riverpod it in the end it does use build context so like it's still using you know the build context to get the data but like it's taking advantage of flutter hooks to make things much more simpler so yeah that's my take on riverpod if you want to talk more about it we can have a good conversation on twitter i guess you know because that's so better. you you kind of said that you uh, experience a lot of performance increase uh, after using riverpod so like yeah, with yeah. performance i would also like to add that there's a new dev tools for okay. flutter yeah. so yeah you can actually ch- check your page like check your performance with the new dev tools because it gives you lots of different options So, like you get flame charts where you can actually take a look at the time which your which it is taking to render, and also there's a new thing called bottom up. So with bottom up, there's call tree obviously, and there's bottom up. So with bottom up, you get an option to view like in a top down manner, in a bottom up manner that uh, the widgets which are in the leaf of your widget tree they'll be rendered first, and so you get a very nice view where you can see that which widget is actually taking a bit of like uh, who is taking the most time. And then you can actually debug it as well, and you also have a, a layout constraint field in Flutter Inspector. So if you go to layout constraint, it's just like you used to do in web. Like you can change and play around with different parameters, and that will actually reflect in the UI. So yeah, after you can like uh, kind of change it and tweak it a little bit, and you find the perfect setting for you, you can go back to your application and change it. There. That's something pretty handy, I would say, and that's a really nice feature in the DevTools. Do you like to add anything more? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, you can use Dev Tools to increase your performance, to check out your performance, to check uh, whether your app is doing something wrong or not. So basically, uh, you can say a checklist before releasing your application. Please check out the Dev Tools. You know, they will give a really good insights about your application. Uh, with Dev Tools and performance, uh, I have another news. Uh, so, what is NNBD Breath? can you explain us ah uh, okay okay so okay coming so what dart is so the next major release of dart is going to have this big, big pretty big instrumental change where it where it gives you null safety so like that's a big thing that's the, that the flutter community is essentially talking about null safety so right now what you have like default values of any variable that you declare will be null and essentially you don't want that because let's say some third party package that you use just throws null out of anywhere and your app fails nobody wants that so like what the flutter team and bunch of people from the community are doing actually like thomas i've seen him in the uh, github issues talking about uh, stuff like yeah thomas andrews also here so yeah null safety is going to bring it's, it's going to be a big instrumental change for flutter like it's going to be you know the next big thing where It, it it makes it, it, there's going to be a bit of pump on the road while you know you transition but in the end it's everything is going to be much more sweeter in the end so yeah, that that's my t- i again i'm not the best person to ask it but uh, i andrews here yeah, i'm definitely going to ask uh, ask that question but like it, it's going to be a good thing in the end that's what i know because the community yeah, exactly. is exactly uh, Yeah, and if so, the uh, audience is also pretty excited about like all the different features, you guys can always go and uh, comment in the chat box, and we'll be adding more questions, and uh, we'll hopefully ask Andrew as well. Yeah, yeah we are excited Andrew for this session. Andrew is there for us. Yeah, yeah. Andrew is there. 
Okay, so one more thing I'd like to add about the null safety is like with Dart 2.8, uh, it kind of paves the road for uh, more features, like more uh, better type checking with Dart. And uh, like uh, there are two actually Dart libraries which I would like to talk, which is one is the Dart IO, which is like the core library. So earlier when you used to do exit, it used to return null. Now you would get a type of never when you just kind of finish it. So that's like more secure. Earlier you used to get nulls everywhere. So now if you migrate it, you'll get a never. So it's it's more type safe, I would say. And also in the Dart HTML package, uh, if you do a stream subscription or cancel, you used to get a null in return. Uh, so right. now you would get a future of uh, empty. So that's that's you can you can do different type of type checks in order to like see exactly what you are at, trying to build and get the exact result out of it. So it's more secure and uh, a lot of cool things about to happen. There's also an enable experiment flag which Dart has been playing around with in the 2.9 preview build, I believe. So like with those, you can actually play around with mixins and all this different stuff and like see for yourself that uh, what is the power of null. So all I right. have another good news yeah. for us that is cold pen and it is really mm. amazing and i have tried it and uh, it's very good so ca can you please can you tell us about something about uh, this cold pen thing yeah so what essentially the plotter team and the code pen team have done they brought dart pad which all of us love to you know share a uh, run dart on, like easily run dart on the web and they brought it to code pen like what that allows you to do is so the idea behind CodePen, it, it, it enriches the idea of, you know, community and community sharing. Like you share designs, you share templates, and that's how CodePen essentially works. Because there's a lot of, you know, great design stuff. And like bringing that, like mixing that with Flutter essentially creates, creates a, I don't know, a dynamic duo of some sorts. Because Flutter is amazing, CodePen is amazing, bringing them to is amazing squared, I guess. So yeah, it, it's pretty interesting and it, it's actually more interesting to see what people are doing with it. So like, obviously this is by Mariano, like if you see his Twitter, like it's actually pretty popping, like he's, he's releasing like uh, clones every three days. And what's interesting is these clones are fast. Like I, I have friends who say, hey, Flutter web still not ready, but mm. I just show them this, hey, yeah, you can write WhatsApp on Flutter. It's, it, it, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty responsive as well. If we drag the screen, it'll change to a completely whatsapp web it's pretty exactly. pretty fast and responsive yeah it's pretty amazing thing mariano is doing actually yeah and it's all in one file like have you ever written mm -hmm. some of uh, this big of a ui in one file like i break things up into like 15 different files when i write my code you know for i don't know for what reason but yeah i do that uh yeah so uh one another thing with Flutter Web that's actually coming in is Canvas Kit. Like I'm pretty damn excited about that. Like it's 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 very much in beta right now. It's in development alpha actually. So like what that brings to the table is Kia running inside WebAssembly. So like all the you know the uh, all the interesting jargons like WebAssembly is an interesting jargon. Kia is an interesting new experiment. You know, Kia is not experimental, but it's it's very interesting. So like bringing that into WebAssembly and running that on a web is really fast. Like I tried one of my projects with it. It works very nicely. Works for you. you every, everybody's got to like definitely try that. <laughs> Yeah, with so many packages, that's that's so cool, right? So that like uh, Flutter currently has around ten thousand packages, and uh, like with the Flutter one point seventeen release, uh, the Flutter team actually solved more than six thousand three hundred and thirty. Uh, GitHub issues, which is quite a lot. So you kind of, uh, you you can be safe and secure that it's almost bug free now. Not completely, that's always there. That's the thing which we regret making an application completely bug free. But yeah, so uh, that's, that's, they've made it uh, very secure and uh, they, they'll they also be releasing builds like three months or so. so it's quite stable now. And uh, yeah, so I think with the desktop as well, there's a lot of uh, plugins and like packages coming out for desktop as well. And uh, even I think now you can actually create the desktop apps in Flutter and also deploy them, like basically use them uh, on Linux or Mac without having any pre-installed Flutter. Uh, like you don't have to pre-configure your Mac or Linux to like set Flutter up there in order to run your Flutter applications. So that is pretty cool. I have tried this, uh, you know, uh, creating a MacBook application and it was way beyond uh, way beyond a year and it was working very good i mean it was in august and it was it was working flawlessly so if so you with, can with write the whole yeah so if you can write 
whole application is flat in a flutter and dart then you i mean you can go for it there is no constraint that can you know stop you okay all right you. so i'm actually going on a tangent here guys so this very interesting question on the youtube chat and it's always you know interesting to talk about it where did you learn flutter Like, because uh, it's always <laughs> an interesting question. So, like, to anybody who can take it up, make it as short as possible. Because we kind of uh, this is a, this is a big story. So, I was actually uh, trying to make an application for myself, and I tried that with Android Java. Then later converted it into Android Kotlin. That took me around three weeks, and then I tried Flutter, and it was around one and half weeks. So, I was like, oh my god, I'm getting Android and iOS with a beautiful UI. in just short span of time then why shouldn't i take this ahead and yeah so now i am a flutter developer super so um yeah so my story is kind of interesting i uh, <laughs> i attended the google io extended in my in my hometown so there i uh, and also i was watching the google io like the live stream and there i just saw something like a flutter sandbox So I was pretty curious about what this sandbox is. So I kind of uh, researched about it, like what is Flutter, what is the sandbox, well, what are they doing, and it's like I I got the kick. I would say like when I saw that it's like a single code base, you can write both for Android and iOS, and I was like, wow, lazy, <laughs> lazy. I can be lazy as lazy as possible and create uh, application <laughs> for both of them. So that's how I went into Flutter. But then I really liked how things were, and I really enjoyed using Dart because kind of Dart takes like the best from every language i would say from javascript from typescript and like they're doing pretty cool thing and like you get so much control with dart and like that's how i got into flutter and then i learned flutter by using like i i am still currently reading a book which is called uh, flutter in action it's by eric windmill i really like that book and uh, apart from that i keep uh, the flutter documentation always handy it's like it's it's super it's super handy they have some really good documentation even when i was trying out flutter desktop or flutter web like they have a very nice set of documentation and you do this and then and this and that and then you have some pretty cool people in the community who are always there to help you out so that's how i got into flutter yeah so you reminded me about community so prith can you tell us about uh, what is community and why are we doing this i mean uh, i could be sleeping at i mean this is the 10:30 and i could be sleeping but i am okay. here awake i'm preparing for this thing same I mean, uh, so we are doing this for community but can you tell me about what exactly is this community thing all right so i have a in different day i'm not actually doing this for community i'm doing this for myself actually because oh. I, i i i love to talk so about selfish <laughs> yeah i'm super selfish when it comes to this so that i'm super selfish but like the whole idea of community you know helping others and populate so like populating is what i actually love to do even at our meetups in mumbai it was like ask questions ask questions ask questions you know like talk with people like try interesting things out like essentially that's what we do right so like that was very inclined with what i like to do and thus you know flutter mumbai came up thus 15 different i do or 8 9 multiple different communities from india are joining together for this day so like yeah it's always pretty interesting to see that happen you know like i'm like yeah sayan is from kolkata right like it's it's pretty interesting to see that happen <laughs> all right so i guess we have six more minutes before uh, andrew comes on um so yeah so what else have you been trying out sayan Have you stumbled upon anything interesting with Plata? Uh, Vivek, to you as well. We, we, that's what we're going in with, basically. Hmm. Anything interesting? Like I've been trying to create. Uh, like I've been trying AR right now. So I've been. I'm really wow. excited with uh, AR. Like I. I want to actually. Uh, implement AR. Like I. I have. I had seen a live stream. I think in Flutter Interact, where they are using Rive with. Uh, Flutter to create some kind of a super cool AR like it actually stores things in the cloud and once you come back you still still find it there. So I saw that in in Flutter Interact one of the live streams and I really found it interesting. So that's what I've been trying. And also there's Hack Twenty coming up, so super excited for that. Uh, like this, I think five 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 hours or so left, and then yeah, thinking of participating, but I still kind of don't have the ideas. So yeah, is there anything you guys have been trying? And guess what? Flutter hack is actually organized by a Flutter community, the biggest yeah. community I think uh, 
uh, right now uh, that is uh, flutter community so it is actually organized by this uh, i have something uh, to be shared uh, in behalf of community and that is i'll read it out the community plays an important role in everyone's life not only in careers also in life okay it helps you in general to grow life and experience everything irrespective of age gender and caste all the developers group provide a space to meet new people like uh, we, we are meeting get to know what kind of work they are doing and give you closer look and for everyone please make sure you join communities interact discuss and collaborate with each other that was that was great and i think it's really beneficial like even if we are like we are kind of discussing and talking amongst ourselves somebody is going to learn something new from that like like preet mentioned uh, riverport and somebody might have heard it for the first time they'll be like oh i'm going to try this so that's how i actually got into rive for as well like i i saw preet talking about it and i kind of looked into it and i really like rive for and got a hooks so yeah there's always someone who's going to benefit from what like even andrew when he he talks about the q and a he discusses this things so somebody might not know the answer to that particular question so yeah that's that's the best part for me about the community talks perfect So, uh, so now it's time to actually bring our next guest, and let's us uh, let us go. I mean, we are done. <laughs> we discuss so many things. So we will be bringing yeah. Yash Adulkar on the screen. Okay, till then, bye bye, Preet. Bye, Sayan. Bye. And bye, Vivek. Thank you, Vivek, Sayan, and Preet for giving us an insight insightful session. We got a lot of information about new upcoming updates and stuff. So guys, as you all know, we have conducted a contest on our social media named hashtag Ask Protect India. So what we did in this contest is we asked you guys like if you have any questions to in Flutter with speakers and everybody else, you can ask your questions to Flutter India team, and the Flutter India host will ask this question to our speaker that is our next uh, next guest. He is none other than he is an engineer manager at Flutter Devel. He always spends his time in working in YouTube channel in YouTube videos for Flutter. is you can see him in the flutter boring show as well as every week he gives us an insightful information about widgets in widget of the week so i would like to welcome andrew prod mr andrew prodgen for this session and also uh, divyansh divyansh bhargav as a co-host for this q&a session so hello andrew hello hello hey, andrew. namaste Hi. assalam alaikum hello everyone it's so nice to be here with you Yeah. yeah we are so excited to have you here like there are so <laughs> many questions people are asking and people are going crazy to ask so many questions i think you can see all the comments which are coming so yeah <laughs> so yeah. so let me let me start with the first question which uh, people ask a lot like how and when did andrew start working on the flutter oh so how did i get started with dart and flutter sort of my yes. my origin story a little bit sure i can speak yeah. about that um I'll try to keep this short. Uh, so I used to be on the mobile ads team at Google, where I worked on AdMob and some other things. And um, after about three years, I was looking around for something different to work on, and I found Flutter internally. They had a little, the little job posting said they were looking for some people to come work on it, and I saw they had an AdMob plugin. So I was like, okay, I could go work on the AdMob plugin. That'll be good for my yeah. current team if I like it. It'll be good for my next team, and. and that'll be a, a great way to find out. So I did that and basically as soon as I wrote the first app I was hooked on Flutter. Uh oh. as soon as I I got in there and started playing with it, which probably a very similar experience for a lot of people out there. Once you actually start coding with it, it's fun, right? It's just yeah. fun to play with. So uh yeah. I eventually transferred onto the team and then I started asking a lot of questions uh of all the other engineers, just dumb getting started questions like how do you how does this widget work and uh widget of the week which you actually mentioned earlier that started because i kept going to an engineer on the team and i would show him some long piece of code that i wrote this like long tortured bit of code and i was like i can't quite get this to work and he'd be like he'd look at it and then he'd look at me and be like we have a widget for that like right there you could just use this widget we already made and so we made widget of the week to help other people learn about all the widgets um and that's that's sort of how i got started Yeah, I think that's the wonderful love story with Flutter. <laughs> so, thank you for the answer, Andrew. So, my next question would be, yeah. 
So which one do you prefer to use for Flutter, VS Code or Android Studio? <laughs> we have people on uh, on our team at Google who use everything. Um, I actually don't use either of those. I use IntelliJ IDEA. Oh. So I, oh. I use IntelliJ IDEA. Uh, when I'm working on Android code, like for a plugin or something, I will go in and use Android Studio, but I like having Android Studio set up just for Android things and IntelliJ set up just for Flutter stuff. But uh, you can find people on the team using uh, Android Studio, VS Code, Emacs, uh, Hans Muller, who works on the on the material design language team, he is a diehard Emacs user. That's what he uses. A bunch of people use VI or Vim, so it runs the gamut. Um, so uh, another question, which lots of people are asking from the Indian community, like they are what they want to start is uh, working on Flutter, and they want to know where can they start working on Flutter, like how can they start working on the Flutter, and where can they get started. So when you say working on the on Flutter, do you mean working with the SDK or actually working on the project that is Flutter, like on the SDK itself? Uh, I want to know both. Like first thing, how person <laughs> can learn, how person can go in and uh, learn the framework and you know make apps with Flutter, and how someone can go and learn the SDK and work on the SDK itself, and how can someone contribute to it? So sorry for asking sure. that question. <laughs> No, 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 no. That's fine. <laughs> this is this is my favorite part of Flutter Day, and and every time we have it. By the way, every time we have a big event, my favorite thing is talking to people directly. I love it. And when they can't, when they couldn't do I/O this year, I got so bummed out because when we have I/O, you know, I get to stand in our little tent, and people come like running up because they've seen me on YouTube and they want to show me the app that they built with their on their phone. It's the greatest thing ever. Uh, so I'm I'm very happy to be here. I'm not I'm not just just saying that. Um, so, but your question, let me answer your question. So um, for someone who wants to get started building with Flutter, you know, building apps with Flutter, I would say um, the number one thing is try to find people. People are the best resource I've ever had for learning, right? And I make we make a lot of resources for learning. The best one is people find a, a meetup. Uh, if you're out there watching this and you're not already involved with any of the, the Flutter meetups in India, there are so many out there and they've all teamed up for this. Um, and that's an amazing resource. And, and so people are always the best. Um, but if you're just looking for, say you're sitting at home right now, just wondering how to get started, I would say Code Labs are a great way to get started. But flutter.dev, we have just gone through a massive rewrite of a whole bunch of our Code Labs and put out a bunch of new ones, including some desktop Code Lab uh, stuff and web Code Labs. Um, and those are a great way to sit down for an hour or so and just code through one thing. You know, let me make an, a simple web app with Flutter and get used to what debugging a web app looks like and things like that. So I would say that's a great way to get started. Dartpad and CodePen are also a great place to get started because you can start with something very small. Uh, so those are, those are good. If you want to become an SDK contributor though, and we'd love to have more people contribute to the SDK, a lot of people are intimidated by that. I certainly was when I started, the idea of actually trying to commit code to the SDK itself and be like, I don't know if I'm, I'm a good enough coder for that. But the team is incredibly nice. I have never seen anyone be rude in a code review or anything like that. They're always happy to see new people. And there are issues in Flutter that are marked as this would be a good issue for somebody as their first one. And you can actually look for those in the issues list. Uh, read, you know, read the issue, read the contributor's guide. And um, if you're willing to, to keep coming back and go through a few rounds of review, you can land a pull request. You know, If you can code, you can be a contributor. That's that's a really awesome uh, description of everything, how you can get started with Twitter. <laughs> so, sure. A lot of users um, ask a question. So the question is, what is new in Flutter web and desktop after Flutter day? What are new oh, things? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so let's see, I mean, the the, we do have new resources, so those are new. So if you're looking to see what you can do with Flutter Desktop and Flutter Web, like I said, those code labs are a great way to get a first-hand uh, first view. We didn't really have a lot of announcements or news during Flutter Day. It was mostly an event for learning and for developers. Um, so I don't know that we had a huge, a huge bit of news there. I mean, the, the question that I often get is, when is Flutter Web gonna be stable, right? When is it gonna be production ready? And the answer there, it's just like when you hear about computer games and they tell you, you know, it'll, we'll release it when it's done. You know, we don't know exactly when that be, will be, but when it's done, that's when we're going to release it. 
And that is certainly the case for Flutter on the web and, and Flutter for desktop. There, there are uh, many engineers working on both, but they're going to be done when they're ready and the team feels confident saying you can trust this, you know? So. Wow. So uh, there is a viewer who asked us a question on Twitter. So mm -hmm. they asked that we have too many state management options. It's confusing. And which one should, should I use? It's confusing. There are so many state ma management are there. So yeah, we've, we've been dealing with this problem forever because it's one of the nice things and frustrating things about Flutter that the Flutter SDK itself really doesn't care what state management approach you want to use. The, the SDK is uh, mostly about, uh, it's opinionated about how your UI is constructed, right? It has like, this is what a row is. This is how constraints work in your UI and things like that. But as far as where you're storing data and where you want to make network calls, Flutter itself really doesn't have an opinion about that which gives you a great deal of freedom, which is good, but it can also be frustrating because you don't know which one to pick. The thing, the thing for me is that it's most important to fully understand the approach that you pick. It almost doesn't matter that much whether you choose Redux or MobX or uh, I think Remy put out a new one, Riverpod just the other day, just because he's that level of genius that he just made a new state management approach <laughs> and just released it. Um, uh, but um, the most important thing is to make sure that you understand how it works, how to test it, and how to work on it with multiple people. There's a great, great talk by Brian Egan, uh, who's a wonderful engineer. He did it at a Dart conference. He has a talk called Keep It Simple State. It is a wonderful talk. You can find it on YouTube where he talks about whichever approach you go with, you should make sure that you can do these things. You should be able to test it. You should be able to understand it. You should be able to... to uh, uh, work on it with multiple people and those sorts of things. And those are what I always suggest people, make sure you can do those those particular things with the approach that you choose because it almost doesn't matter that much. There are many choices you have that you can pick and still make a great app. And I know that's probably not the answer that the people were, were at. They wanted me to sort of pick one thing and say, this is the one I use and you should use it too. Um, but to be honest, it like I said, you're not you're not going to regret building something like Redux, for example, right? It's a very proven pattern. It's a it's a wonderful piece of software. You're not going to regret using uh, Block, for example. It's used internally at Google, and a number of people have put out apps with it, right? So try the one that looks the best for you. If if you don't like it, it's quick to code and flutter. You can swap it out for another one. It'll probably take you a couple of days, right? So yeah. Uh, so yeah, in comments, uh, someone Rishit uh, Rishit says that Andrew's uh, prag uh, pragmatic state management talk was cool for this. So yeah, that's uh, Philip's and, talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so someone says that it's Andrew's talk. It's not me. Sorry. Oh, I'll tell I'll tell Philip that I own it now. I'll let him know. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> been... <laughs> okay. So uh, our next question from the audience is. Is there a way we can use Flutter for drone or IoT applications development, IoT application development? Oh, for Internet of Things development? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, the the Flutter definitely wants you to be able to embed it. You know, the idea with Flutter is that you should be able to code once and, and take that code wherever you need to go, you know, uh, to web or desktop. And those are sort of the areas the team is going after right now. But people have run Flutter on a Raspberry Pi. I don't know if you all have ever seen that that project, but it has been done. Um, and so uh, I know that is one way to go about it for, I mean, Flutter is built for putting pixels on a screen. So for if you're doing like a real embedded system, like I'm making this box that has some wires coming out of it, you really don't need Flutter unless it has a screen on it, right? Um, but I know that, uh, that Raspberry Pi has worked in the past um, and, I'm sure if you if you had another system that you wanted to build an embedder for Flutter for, the team would be only too happy to talk to you on GitHub. They would probably be very interested to see it. Yeah, and also there are uh, so many uh, blogs for running uh, Flutter on IoT devices. And I remember mm -hmm. Emily uh, gave a talk about uh, it uh, where she made some hair, like hairs with IoT devices and uh, using uh, the yep. Yeah, so those are really awesome. If someone is interested, please go and check that out. And so another interesting uh, question uh, which people are asking is, like, is there a way to run a Dart code in background after app is being killed? 
So sure. running the um, yeah. So this is a question we've been getting more and more. We haven't been able to invest a bunch of resources in it, um, but the uh, we do have some samples in our samples repo. It's uh, github.com slash flutter slash samples. We have some add to app samples. And in there, you can see code that is spinning up a flutter engine and then launching like an activity or a view controller to display that engine in. So a flutter engine is the context uh, sort of in which flutter runs. So it'll spin up a, it'll spin up the dart VM for you. It will uh, initialize the three threads that Flutter uses to do its work, uh, and it'll start uh, doing some other background work to, to make Flutter sort of happen. And then once you've done that, you can say, OK, Flutter engine, I want you to display this, this uh, entry point in this activity or on iOS, this view controller. And you can actually see that happening in these samples. And what you can do is have native code, because background tasks tend to be native APIs, platform APIs, right? So you can write some native code that say connects to Android's alarm manager or does some geofencing within like a, a service or something like that. And when it wakes up from the background, it can then instantiate a Flutter engine and either run some dark code or launch a Flutter activity or Flutter view controller. And so that's a way that you can have background tasks that are sort of spawned by the back, you know, on the native side, execute some dark code or some Flutter code. There are very few resources for this, I, I must be honest, because it's not something we've had time to document. We're starting to get asked this question more and more, so you're probably going to see some more in the future. Um, but if anybody out there wants to go boldly, check out those samples, check out the docs for Flutter Engine, and try it, and then write a blog post on it. You probably make yourself famous. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think it's a really good opportunity for all the community or all the people in the communities mm -hmm. out there. And I think they should go and you know work, and it's a kind of great opportunity to write a blog on. I think so. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, so next question is from Reef. So he's asking how to do performance testing of Flutter applications. Oh well, um, I'm going to say Philip's name again. Uh, Philip <laughs> is our expert for performance testing. I would. Um, so we have. Um, there is a person on the team, Yu Chan, who knows everything about performance testing. Uh, he is the expert, I think, for the entire Flutter team. So if you go look at his pull requests on GitHub, that is actually an excellent study in people uh, doing very, very good performance testing. Um, there's also a number of tests within the Flutter Flutter repo where um, they use the old Flutter gallery. And every time they make a code change to Flutter, they run a whole bunch of performance tests just to make sure that some change you know, off in the distance in the SDK didn't slow down some other part of Flutter. So they want to make sure that the frame rate is still what it's supposed to be. So the Flutter repo is actually a great place to learn about that. Um, we also have, uh, we certainly have a testing guide uh, on the website. So if you go to flutter.dev, you can see our testing guide where you can see it using a widget tester to alter some widgets, and then measure how, how long it took. And we actually have one of our Google Summer of Code participants is landing a sample in the samples repo. It will include some performance testing, so. Yeah. Uh, so one more question which I uh, got from YouTube comments is, Flutter is so awesome. And can, how, when will it replace the uh, conventional native uh, development frameworks, like Android or iOS? Uh, never. I, I don't yeah. anticipate that ever happening. Um, and uh, for a good reason. I mean, we get these, these sorts of questions all the time. You know, people love to compare frameworks. I've certainly done it many, many times. But, it, you know, Flutter is one tool in the toolbox. There's never going to be just one, one way to make apps, right? There are people out there building billion dollar apps with native toolkits like uh, the Android Views and, and UI Kit. And I think that will always be the case. I think Flutter will continue to grow. Uh, but I don't think it will ever be like the only way to make apps or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, another question which we have is from Nash, and uh, he's asking, when can we expect a preview of Hot UI Screen Mirror or some form of inline ID preview for Flutter? Oh goodness! I wish Jacob were here. Uh, <laughs> Jacob's the tech lead for our, our tools and like the IntelliJ plugin. I don't know that they have that on a in a particular place on the roadmap. I know we're constantly adding tools. Like you, you, if you watched our, one of our live streams today on performance and uh, and the dev tools, you saw the layout explorer that they've been working on. Um, 
I don't know that they have a hard date for that. If it's something that you definitely want, though, I would encourage you find the issue or the feature request for it in the IntelliJ plugin or the tools repo on GitHub and go in there and put a comment on it and say, hey, this is important to me. This would really make it easier for me to develop with Flutter. Please invest time in it. The SDK team and the tools team, they pay a lot of attention to those sorts of comments and uh, putting, you know, people come in and put a thumbs up on issues. They love it when people do that because it helps them know what people need. Yeah. Amazing. So next question is from audience. So what they say is, when can we expect Flutter Web to be out of beta channel and into stable? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's the one we get that we get asked that all the time. Again, it it'll be re when it's ready, it will be done. And believe me, I will be only too happy to tell you all about it when that day comes. I will be screaming it from YouTube to let everyone know. I'll be so happy. Um, but I, I mean, there are there are many engineers working on Flutter Web, and in you know it makes progress every day. And when it's ready, we will definitely let y'all know. But I don't I don't have a date. Well, yeah, so, because actually stable. And as you know, like the Flutter in the website is actually made from complete Flutter Web. Like it hasn't been mm -hmm. used in it is completely made Flutter Web, and they're pretty stable. Like there was some mm -hmm. issues starting the coding, but then now it is pretty stable. The website, you can check yep. that. Yeah. First thing I did when I saw the website was open the inspector to see if I could see the little FLT dash to see if you had the flutter for web elements in there. Very first thing I did. <laughs> uh, yeah, so another very interesting question is coming where uh, a viewer is asking that he's creating an app and it is really big in size uh, in flutter compared to uh, the other app, like other frameworks. So how he can reduce the flutter application sizes? Flutter uh, APK build from Flutter application. How can they reduce it? Sure, sure. That's a common question. Um, there will because Flutter for Web packs its whole rendering engine. You know that one of the the nice things about Flutter is that you get the very same, literally the same code on multiple platforms because it compiles into a, a native binary, and you get the same rendering stack uh, no matter where you are. Because the good the good part about that is consistency. The bad part is you have to add a little bit more code to make that happen, right? On a purely Android app, you can tap into some system libraries and it, and you can have a smaller APK. Um, and the team, you know, one of the things that you can do is just stay with Flutter because the team is constantly working to bring that that size down. I think it was six point something when I joined the Flutter team for an Android app, like a minimal Flutter Android app, and now it's four point something. So they've gotten it down by almost a third um by doing some things and i know they continue to do work on it um dart does tree shaking automatically so it will take any unused dart code it will not uh include in your final app it does that automatically uh and if you're building for android the same things you would normally do with android like proguard and some things like that you can still do with a flutter app there won't be as much native code in there um but you can still you know have a proguard file and and uh do some minification of your app <clears throat> uh, you can also, there are also some techniques if you're using assets on both native code and in Flutter. There are some ways that uh, you can use a platform channel call, for instance, to go get a native asset and then send it over to Flutter so you don't have to have two copies of it. There are some things that you can do that way. Um, so hopefully it gave, gave some, some ideas to whoever posted that question. Yeah, it would be really helpful for them. So a next question from audience is, how would you consider someone as a Flutter expert? How will be here? How would I, consider, how would I someone? consider someone? Oh, goodness. Uh, when I feel I become one, maybe I'll know then. Uh, <laughs> let me think. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a real definition for it. We don't have a certification program <laughs> for Flutter the way there are some for, uh, for Android. I don't know that they're thinking, I don't know that there's been any plans to spin one up. Um, no, I think I think Flutter, it's how many, what apps have you built? You know, that's probably the best way to to judge someone's skill, so. Yeah, so another question uh, which we got from YouTube comments is, can we use Flutter to develop AR apps? Yeah. Augmented reality Oh, for apps? AR apps. Um, hmm. So the, I. Yeah, I mean, you can use Flutter for just about anything, right? It's it's whether it's yeah. the right tool for the job that would be the question, right? So the difficulty there with AR would be 
finding a way to blend the things that you're getting from native Android with the UI presented by Flutter. So there are some things that um, if you were just pulling in data and you're going to render it completely with Flutter, that would be one thing that you could do. And that would probably work out just fine. For example, we've done um, done things with the camera and with TensorFlow. We have a video out where Matt Sullivan does face detection with uh, TensorFlow. And that, you know, he's pulling in data from TensorFlow, but then displaying what he wants to display using Flutter. Um, if you were going to try to blend the 3D that is so common with augmented reality, right? The, the 3D aspect uh, of that, that's not something Flutter supports right now. We don't expose the 3D part of the GL surface that we're drawing on. So you could certainly, uh, if you really wanted to do an app that involved AR and Flutter, I would say run Flutter, but when you wanted to do the AR view, launch a native activity or a native view controller and do the AR bit in there. And then when you're done, close that down and come back to the Flutter display. So the next question is like, how to implement search engine optimization in Flutter web? Is there a way to implement? Oh, goodness. Now? I'm sorry. I don't actually know off the top of my head. You got me, you got me. You stumped me on this one. Um, mm -hmm. I something that is constantly been coming up ever because it, you know, it's very important for websites to make sure you have SEO. Um, and I know that there is the semantics API in browsers that you can take advantage of. I imagine something will be done there, but I don't know off the top of my head. I would say, I guarantee you though, if you go to the Flutter Flutter repo and you search for web and SEO, you will find the issue where they are talking about it and it will have all the facts because they will have been talking about it for a while. So I would go search GitHub for that. It will be a better resource than I will, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, another amazing question is, uh, what is build context in Flutter? Like, I think we have talked about this on Flutter Day as well. And like, how is it different <laughs> from context in Android and like other places? We are passing build context everywhere in themes, in navigation. So sure. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, this is actually one of the questions I had back when I started Flutter. I didn't know what that was. I knew what you could use it for, but I didn't really know what it was, right? And um, and this, uh, if if I have an, a, a sort of advantage over anyone else when it comes to Flutter, it's that I have very easy access to the people who made Flutter. So it's very easy for me to go and bother them with my questions. And I did that. I went and talked to Ian Hickson, who's the tech lead for Flutter. Um, and I asked him, I asked him this question, and he helped me understand it. So. Um, uh, let me ask the two of you, are you familiar with elements with Flutter? If I mentioned an element, would you know what I meant? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you, you mean elements uh, as a single widget or? Not quite. So here, let me, um, I'm going to do some pantomime here. This will, this will be uh, potentially weird, but we'll see how it goes. So in Flutter, okay. we think of building uh, widgets. We think of the app as represented by widgets, right? Okay, but there are, yeah. and you have a tree of widgets. So you have a root widget at the top, maybe a material app. And then under that, you'd have a scaffold, maybe in an app bar and a body. And then you have some other widgets that come down. And we tend to think of our app as that tree of widgets. But Flutter actually maintains several other trees. There is a tree of elements, and there's a tree of render objects, for example. And an element, you may have heard, for example, a widget can be used multiple times. One widget could be used multiple times in the same Tree. And, you're like, and I remember seeing that and I was like, that doesn't work in Android. I don't know how you're doing that. Like, that's not, that's not right. But the way that they do it is by using elements. An element is what is actual is the piece of your UI that's actually on the screen at any given moment. So Flutter keeps track of something called an element, uh, the element tree. And for each widget, whenever you want to put that onto the screen, Flutter makes an element and says, okay, so I'm going to have a material app. I'll make an element that'll hold onto my material app widget. And then below that, I'll have an element to hold onto my scaffold widget. And it has, so it makes these two trees. And so you can take a widget and have it at multiple points. The same one, you just have multiple elements that point to the same widget. And so a build context is actually an element. So when you go and you call, and that build method on your state, stateless widget, say, has that build method, and it gets a build context, right? That's Flutter's way of saying, hey, stateless widget, I want you to build children for me and I'm going to put them underneath this element. And so that's where you really are in the tree, because this stateless widget could be at several points, right? It could be at several places in the tree. And the element is where it actually is at that moment when it says, hey, 
Can you go build some children for me? We have a series of videos on this, by the way, that does not involve me making gestures that look like this. I highly recommend it. It's called Widgets 101. It's on our YouTube channel. It's a much, much better explanation than you just saw me do. Um, but it's the same basic info. So yeah, uh, basically a build context is an interface that mm -hmm. an, an element has and fills out. And so it just means, hey, Widget, I'm going to put you on the in the tree that is the UI. I'm going to put you at a particular spot, and that's where you are. Um, and so that's this is another thing I learned very on, early on with Flutter. I was like, I, I saw elements referenced in the docs. I was like, what the heck is an element? I thought we were doing widgets, and then I went down sort of a rabbit hole for several weeks figuring all this out. Uh, yeah, so, yeah and then we made videos to make it quicker for people. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I think your explanation was pretty <laughs> well. And yeah. Even we, we even we didn't knew about that, so thanks a lot for that. Uh, so <laughs> it was a very uh, long-winded answer. Thank you for staying with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there are uh, lots and lots of questions about Dart uh, nullability feature, which is in preview, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure where to start because there are so many questions. Like people are asking, what is the la late keyword in Dart nullab nullable safety? Uh, how mm -hmm. should I start get start with it? Uh, how is it helpful for my code? So I want you to mm -hmm. take the screen and you know just give a brief about uh, nullability in Dart. Sure. Uh, so I'm very excited about non-nullability in Dart. It's been a long-standing feature request. I think it's going to make it a lot easier to code in Dart. So we're very very excited to see it land. Hopefully, uh, anybody watching now also saw the talk that Kevin and Bob gave uh, during Flutter Day. It's a wonderful resource that's the a product manager and one of the people who actually designs the language gave a talk uh, and they're very, very good uh, as they did explain it. Um, to, for me, I would say, um, let's see, to learn null safety. I mean, null safety, the, the main point of null safety is to make it easier to code in Dart and to make Dart applications more efficient. So Flutter applications too. So Dart has a sound null safety, which means once you have code that is completely opted in to null safety, which means all of your dependencies are using null safety and your application are using null safety, Dart can guarantee that null will never be in a value, in a variable that's supposed to not be null. So if you say this is a non-null field, Dart can guarantee that it will never be null, which means there's a whole bunch of checks that Dart doesn't have to do. And it actually, we've seen an increase in performance in uh, apps once non-nullability is in it. Uh, so you get an increase in performance, and you will know you won't get nearly as many uh, null pointer exceptions, null reference exceptions, because you'll know exactly when you might and might not have null. Um, so that's why we're very excited. It is in the process of landing in the Dart SDK, and it's in the process of landing in the Flutter SDK as well. So um, sometime uh, the technical preview has come out. So there are some instructions for playing with it. If you'd like to go download the SDK and and use the flags. Uh, you can find a blog post on it that it give you uh, instructions on how to do it. But the best way to try null safety is to go to the null safety version of Dartpad, uh, which is one of my projects on the on the team. So I'm very familiar with it. If you go to nullsafety.dartpad.dev, you'll get a separate version of Dartpad with a different build of the SDK. And it has, if you look in, there's a little drop down on it. It says learn with snippets. There's a little drop list and it has 11 snippets. Um, and they will walk you through the features of null safety. So it'll start you off with what is a non-nullable type? And then it's like, okay, if, I, if this is a non-nullable type, how do I get back to being a nullable type? What does that mean? How do I do that? And then it shows the late keyword and it shows uh, how the exclamation point, the assertion operator works and some other things. So I would definitely recommend that as a first stop. And there's also some documentation on dart.dev. I think it's dart.dev slash null safety to check out. Um, but we're going to be talking a lot about null safety through the next half of the year. So we'll be making hopefully videos on it and more blog posts. We'll be updating some of our samples as we can as the features land in the SDKs. We're very, very excited about it. It's going to be a lot of fun to code with. So null safety actually reduces our code and increases our performance. So it's kind of like a win-win situation. Yeah. yeah, it's a wonderful feature. They've worked really, really hard on it. The Dart language team is amazing. So yeah, yeah I th I think uh, we are done with our time. <laughs> uh, I think we are exceeded our time, and thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for coming. Uh, I think I, I know it's uh, late for you, and but thank you so much for coming and joining us uh, with us and answering such an awesome questions with some awesome explanations you gave. 
and uh, thanks again. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, uh, like I said, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me here. I love talking to people about Dart and Flutter. So this has been a treat. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We'll, bye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew, Yash, and Devanshu for the wonderful session. I hope lots of questions get answered well. Now, moving on to the next session, I would like to introduce Mr. Shivuthu Kumar from Orlando. He has over 12 years of experience working with mobile, web, and cloud technologies. He worked at Computer Service Inclusive as an architect. Today, he is going to talk about, about building Flutter application using GraphQL with Hasura. So welcome, Shumuthu. And hope audience has so excitement to do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak Hello. with you. Hi. Thanks for inviting me to speak at. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us and giving the time for us to introduce yourself and giving knowledge. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me share my screen and uh, start the session. Give me a second. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Thanks for inviting me to speak at Flutter India 2020 today. I'm delighted to be here to be part of this amazing community. Um, today I'm going to talk on uh, Flutter apps powered by GraphQL with Hasura. Um, already Andrew answered like a lot of questions about the Flutter. Uh, so this demo is like particularly focusing on how we can integrate the GraphQL server with Hasura. And uh, already I got introduced. Uh, my name is Shiva, uh, working as architect in uh, Computer Enterprises Inc., focusing on mobile cloud and IoT solution. Um, you can reach me at my Twitter handle uh, at Kesavamuthu. I'm happy to chat with you if you have any questions uh, after this session or at any time. So the agenda of the session today is like already I told, I'm going to explain a few GraphQL concepts and how to set up quickly the Hasura GraphQL server so you can power your Flutter apps with the uh, GraphQL backends. And also how we can integrate the GraphQL server with the Flutter app and what are the different uh, uh, packages we can use so that we can integrate the Flutter apps with the GraphQL. And uh, finally, a short demo on, uh, on this GraphQL and the Flutter thing. So for the Flutter, I think, uh, no introduction needed for Flutter, right? Because uh, you guys are already like uh, learning Flutter and uh, you know like uh, what is Flutter about. If you want to know like what is Flutter, I would explain in like uh, simple terms. Um, it's a UI toolkit. And uh, using this Flutter, you can create like a stunningly beautiful labs and also like it's natively compiled. So that's like a big trade off, uh, uh, trade off that's going on between cross-platform and the native solution when you are taking the decisions on your mobile project. Trust me, I'm working on the mobile project from like a 2008 and nine. I started working on like the iOS and Android. There is always some discussion going on like, okay, I need to share the code base. At the same time, I need like the native like performance. So that trade-off decision Flutter is solving that, and the Flutter is like one of the great solution to meet both requirements. You are sharing the code base, and also like you are uh, building a beautiful UI with the native uh, uh, native speed uh, widgets, right? So that's what like the Flutter uh, Google UI toolkit for building beautiful and natively compiled applications. And not only like the mobile, it's expanding its uh, uh, area to like a web, desktop, and like the embedded uh, devices as well. Right. So now let's talk about the GraphQL. So let's see like what's a GraphQL. GraphQL is nothing but a spec. It's a specification. 
that specification is uh, under the standard is created by the Facebook and curated by the community that provides like more efficient and uh, uh, powerful, flexible alternative to the REST API. And it's a query language for your APIs. What does that mean is it's like a declarative way of fetching and updating the data. Uh, I would explain like uh, what is the declarative way of uh, fetching and updating the data uh, in a moment. So this is the traditional system, right? Now let's see this diagram. This is the traditional system. This is how the REST API works. So we are having this client. It can be like any client, web or mobile. And this client is making a call to the different endpoints. For example, I'm making a post, then API slash v1 slash post. Mm -hmm. If I'm making a comment to the post, then I'm saying like a post slash API slash v1 slash uh, comment, right? So I'm pointing to like a different endpoints. So what this uh, does this client is doing is it's making a call to the different endpoint and this arbitrary code and that arbitrary code is making uh, either fetching or updating the data source. So this is like the overall uh, traditional REST approach. So client having multiple endpoints. Uh, but there are like a certain concerns GraphQL is trying to solve from the traditional REST approach. One is under fetching. Let's see like we are having this mobile application, right? And this mobile application is like a, a, is a theme park application. And we are having the park name and uh, that mobile application is uh, listing the ride names here. And also like uh, how much time, how much time like we need to wait for that particular ride. So that waiting time is also here, right? So what's the problem that's happened in the REST API that's usually is whenever we are trying to build this UI, in mobile app or in web app, we are having like a, we don't have enough information to build the UI at the first call itself. If you are following the risk standards, right? For example, here to get the park details, I need like API slash v1 slash parks. And to get like uh, the particular park details like open time or close time, I need to call like another call like a park details. To get the right information, I need like more calls and to get the wait time information, I'm making like more calls because we are following the REST specific pattern and REST specific pattern is about the resource. So that resource is like uh, uh, all the data you need to build for the UI that would not be coming into that uh, single call. So you are making like more and more call like a waterfall of request to get like all the data to build this UI, right? Or other thing, what we are doing, usually end up in doing is, we are uh, creating a custom endpoint that is not like a REST standard based, but that custom endpoint is like a two tied with the uh, client. For example, this mobile app, I need like specific information. So I might be ending with like a creating the uh, URL for like the custom view based uh, URL. In the same way, if I'm developing an application for Apple Watch or something, on that Apple Watch, I don't uh, uh, require like all other fields. So probably I would end up in like creating another REST endpoint for that particular Apple Watch, or I have like too much information to just show like a single label in my Apple Watch. So that's a problem GraphQL is uh, trying to solve uh, uh, using their API spec uh, that's different from the REST service. So one is under fetching and another one is over fetching. This is the one I told the example for the Apple Watch here. I have this uh, two fields that needs to display in my Apple Watch, but I'm getting like uh, around 60 fields that's coming from back from the service, but I am not going to display all that thing. I'm just going to display like only two fields. So this is called over fetching because we are getting like a lot of data from the network but I don't need to display that in the UI, right? So these are like a couple of concerns that uh, GraphQL is trying to solve. So how it works, it works in the simple principle, what you want is what you get. So what you need to do is the first step, describe your data. So this is like the major uh, uh, important thing in the GraphQL. So we need to define the type and that type is like, uh, um, that's a contract that's going to share between uh, client and the server. 
So we are saying like right now in the REST API, we don't have that kind of contract. We don't know like what type that's coming from the server. So GraphQL is providing the spec so that we can share that type between client and server here. And what client is doing is it's going to ask uh, from the server like, uh, uh, I need this information and I am passing this parameter for that particular information. And the server is going to resolve the data and return the data as exactly as client asked for. For example, in this type, we are having name, tagline and contributors, but I'm not interested in like name and contributors. I'm just interested in graph uh, tagline only. So client is making the query with the tagline as a field and the server is going to return only the tagline. It's not going to return the name and contributors. So that's how like the GraphQL uh, API spec is working. That's how like uh, um, that's how like uh, uh, the GraphQL is trying to solve like uh, what um, what field that's required and that field is like returning back from the server. And back to this diagram, you're having this uh, REST and GraphQL. So we see like the REST having like uh, the single client that's making like multiple calls to the different endpoints, right? But in the GraphQL, the spec is saying like we are having only one endpoint and that one endpoint itself is like a HTTP post endpoint. So this one single endpoint that's making like a, a resolving using its arbitrary code and it's making fetching or updating the database uh, using this arbitrary code. So instead of having like multiple endpoints, we are having only single post endpoint. And in that post endpoint, uh, we are submitting like the query, basically that query, what the client is going to ask for the server. So we are going to post it in the endpoint and the server would be written back from a database or update the database using this arbitrary code. So that's how like the GraphQL is uh, differ from the rest. Um, so uh, the couple of components in the GraphQL spec is like the types. So this is the type we are going to share between client and server. And we are having like queries, mutations. Queries is like whenever you are going to fetch the data from the server and mutation is like whenever you want to update the data uh, in the database. And subscription is nothing but like the live uh, updates. So whenever some mutation happen, we are going to notify the other clients like uh, this mutation happened. Are you interested in that mutation, right? So that kind of subscription uh, that would be opening the WebSocket connection between client and server. So whenever uh, uh, the mutation is happening, the server would be sending update to the subscriptions. And resolver is nothing but your arbitrary code and uh, database layer that would be taking care of like updating the data and it would be sending the response back to that uh, client. So that's like the overall GraphQL uh, introduction. As I said, like a GraphQL is a specification and uh, since it's like a specification, you can use that in like any platform protocol or language. As long as you are following the spec, uh, you can implement it in like any uh, thing. And also like GraphQL would be coming in the two different uh, type of SDKs, one is GraphQL server SDKs, where you can use that GraphQL server to resolve your data source and send back the data. And the other one is GraphQL client SDK, where it's talking with the GraphQL server uh, uh, server and making the query or making the mutation. So today we are going to talk about like the Flutter GraphQL client SDK and how it's making the uh, request to the GraphQL server. And also a couple of other things we need to see important here in the GraphQL is like a GraphQL versioning because uh, the versioning, whenever we are making a mobile application, you know, right? Once we release to the app store, we don't have control on updating the code. That means uh, we always cannot like force a user to update the application. If you are releasing like version one or version 1.1 or version two, uh, the the spread of the user, they may not be updating the application. So still you need to support the version one, even though you have released the version two, right? So there is always like the, those kind of versioning problems that would be coming when you are building the mobile apps. So for GraphQL, 
the versioning is happening not at the server level the versioning is happening at the field level because the client is only going to ask like a what data you need for right so it's having like the amazing versioning uh, uh, versioning capabilities you can just like uh, duplicate the field or you can add the new field without affecting like any existing client or without modifying the server code uh, much and also like uh, there are other concepts such as uh, graphql schema stitching where you can like uh, stitch the graphql schema multiple graphql schema and bring like a unified response that would be like more uh, uh, more advanced feature where you want to like uh, unify your multiple microservices or multiple graphql schemas so there are like a certainly a huge number of advantages in the graphql so now um, i will show the demo and i will uh, show you like how we can build the hasra graphql and also like how we can integrate that graphql into uh, the flutter application so today i am going to talk about this uh, uh, the demo the demo is nothing but like the developer emotion tracker as you know like based on the recent incidents that happened in india the mental health is like more important thing especially for like a developers because we are in like a, a thinking and imagining and also like the mental uh, or like memory based work right so for us uh, tracking the emotions is more important specifically like a developer based emotions right so i have created this demo um, so it has like a couple of screens uh you just need to enter the name and once you enter the name you can see like uh, what are the different type of developer emotions that's posted by other developers uh, if you need to add like the emotion in your journal you can just like click a uh, plus button here and you can select like uh, one of the emotion right now you are in and uh, you can choose like what specific developer activity that triggered that emotion right for example here i can choose like i'm angry because i got some build errors or i'm anxious because i got some big meeting or presentation that's going to happen tomorrow or like i'm uh, happy because i did some uh, uh, sport event like running or walking so we need to track the emotion that's like most important uh, because uh, there is no positive or negative emotions right the only thing is how we are reacting to the specific emotion for example anger is like not the negative emotion anger is the one who loves you very much that's why that personality or like that, that emotion is coming up because it's want to prevent you so i'm just seeing that kind of like a tracking event that should be happen in the developer community so i just created this demo just for uh, showing like uh, how it should work uh, so i will just show like uh, how i build this system and how i develop this graphql server um so the first thing is i need to set up the graphql server so for that i have used the hasura hasura is like one of the open source graphql engine so you can set that up and you need to uh, attach that to the postgresql uh, postgresql database and uh, once you create like a, what are the tables you want to add here i have added like activities categories emotions and journal and also like the user table so once you have added this table and uh, specify like uh, what are the fields it should be having and also like uh, specify the relationship everything is done boom your graphql server is ready right so you can just like uh, uh, play with your graphql server here with uh, different queries the queries should be like for example here i need to get like all the emotions listed here uh, i need like a title and i i am going to need like a icon here if i am executing that it's going to list only the title and icon from the emotion entity for example i don't need like a title i need like only icon to display that in like uh, in my apple watch or in my embedded device i can just like uh, change the query here that would be listing only the icon from the graphql server right so this how it should be uh, working based on like what you want to uh, ask from the server and the server would return like uh, what you asked for and same thing like uh, for the query we have like a mutation also mutation is nothing but like whenever you want to um, for example like insert the emotion or insert the journal 
or update the journal or delete the journal. So there are like a, all these query and the mutation and also like the subscription is automatically created by the Hazura based on your PostgreSQL uh, table schema. So if you want to set up like a quick prototype and also like you need like advanced features such as GraphQL, you can use this Hazura for setting this up, right? So that's uh, about the Hazura. Now we come to this, uh, the important thing, how we are going to integrate the Flutter with the GraphQL server, right? I will show some of the code. So this is the sample code I have built for this application. So the starting point here is, uh, I have added a couple of dependency in my in my pubspec.yaml. So the GraphQL Flutter, this is one of the package that's used for GraphQL client integration for the Flutter or the dot SDK. There are like a couple of other SDKs also available, but this is like a, one of the most popular GraphQL client SDK for the Flutter. So you can add that in the dependency. And once that is done, you need to configure like a, which server I'm going to talk to that, right? So I'm having that in the lib GraphQL in the config dot dot. So here I'm constructing like the HTTP link and the WebSocket link. WebSocket link is for subscriptions and HTTP link is for like the single endpoint for your query and mutation, right? So I have configured this one and I'm initializing the client using this value notifier. I'm just like constructing my GraphQL client and returning it back. And once I have this set up this config, you can go to this uh, main dot dot and uh, wrap your material application with a GraphQL provider and also like the cache provider if you want to cache the result. So in the GraphQL provider, you need to provide this client, the config dot initialize client, which is the same GraphQL client we configured for. So once that is done, you can use this GraphQL client to make a query mutation and also like a, you can listen for the subscription. So whenever some changes happen, that would be reflected in like all client application, right? Um, so they have provided like a couple of widgets for uh, query and mutation. I will quickly show how that looks like. Um, so before that, this is the one we are going to look at, right? So let's see like uh, how I am getting the emotion, this uh, screen from my GraphQL server. So let's go to the emotion dot dot screen here. And this is my widget and I'm building my body widget here. So in this body widget, I'm having this query. So this query widget has a couple of uh, parameters like uh, options and also builder. Options is nothing but uh, your query option saying like a what GraphQL query you are going to query. So here in the get all emotions, this is the query I'm going to make to my server. So if you copy that and put it in your uh, in your uh, the GraphQL playground here, you can see like the data is coming as emotion with ID, title, and icon, right? So we are going to get this data and render that in the Flutter uh, widget. So now let's back to the code, emotion dot dot. So here I'm saying like, okay, this is my query. And once that query result is available, can you please uh, build that query result widget, which is nothing but like a grid with a cross axis count three. So in the query result widget, I'm getting like the result. I'm just checking like whether it has exception, whether it's loading or not. And once the data is available, I'm just like uh, uh, building my uh, Flutter widget here based on the data. So it's like a pretty simple, right? You are just making the GraphQL query and you are wrapping it with like a query widget and that would be taking care of uh, fetching the data and rendering it in that uh, application. So think about like if you are building the, if you are using the same code for building the small screen device or like a web application, or if you want to display like more data to your UI, you can control that in your, uh, GraphQL query, you are building it here, and you can change the how it's rendered in like multiple devices. So that's like the power of GraphQL server where you can access like uh, what are the data you need to display. So that's like the example of uh, uh, the query. 
and also for mutation mutation is like a, i need to save what my emotions are so that mutation you can just like a, do the same thing wrap that with a mutation widget and provide like a what query you want to do so this query is like just inserting your journal and uh, i'm just returning the floating action button and on pressed i'm running the mutation with the particular data so i'm saying like okay save the journal with the user id emotion id and activity id so this mutation will be run using this query and that would be inserting the data into your graphql server uh, so that's how like uh, the mutation work so you can like uh, same here you can say like i'm happy because i did some coding in flutter and clicking that it's added immediately here and also see, did you see like the notification that's happened on like the other uh, device basically it's trying to notify like the other users like someone posted about their emotions right so that kind of notification for that notification we we are adding the subscription so this subscription is nothing but like the graphql subscription which is opening the websocket uh, connection to the graphql server so basically it's like uh, one of your stream subscription listen method so i'm saying like okay just to give me like the latest journal entry whenever it's posted so here we are having like a graphql client dot subscribe and passing the operation and on the listen method whenever there is a change is happening we are just like uh, uh, we are getting like a what data that's coming in so once that is uh, received i'm just like displaying the notification here to say like uh, something happened or like some user posted uh, this emotion do you want to check that out that kind of notification i'm showing so it would be happen for like uh, all devices that who are listening into that for example i'm having like a uh, 10 devices if some user posted then it would be notified to like all the devices but you can control the logic uh, based on like uh, how it should be and uh, i am trying to add like another uh, emotion here let's uh, party because uh, we are having some meetups right so once it's added then it's like uh, immediately showing the notification like uh, jason is doing party here and also like uh, you can see this is updated so it's keep on like looking for the changes and whenever the changes happen it try to pull the new image um, incrementally and using that cache provider it would be fetching like only the updated data so that's how like the overall uh, the graphql with the flutter integration uh, goes um, and back to this uh, presentation here i have this reference um, i have the slide here and also i have built this uh, dev emotion tracker like uh, a year ago with uh, with the firebase so you can see here like the same uh, application with the firebase flutter and firebase integration and the same application here with some advanced concept um, with the uh, flutter and graphql so you can compare like uh, how firebase working and what are the features firebase gives and if you want to integrate with the graphql how graphql works and what are the features graphql gives so it's not like side by side comparison but you can compare like the different approaches where you can integrate your uh, flutter apps and a uh, uh, couple of uh, links for like a flutter to try the uh, hasura and also like the graphql flutter package and uh, finally like a couple of action items for you uh try to build flutter apps with the graphql and also like the firebase and explore hasura and see like uh, how quickly you can set up the postgres sql and uh, uh, running up the graphql server and finally like a uh, be kind and spread your awesomeness that's like more important thing be kind to everyone um, and reach me out if you have any questions uh, this is my twitter handle and uh, this is my github uh, uh, handle so you can just like go there and see like what are the different uh, flutter repos i have created so that you can take that as a reference and if you have any questions uh, uh, let me know in the dm um, and uh, finally thank you i think i saved my time <laughs> thank you very
thank you so much shivam mutter kumar for the wonderful session now it's too much of talk back to back to talk oh my god i think we got a bored little need some fun activity and now i'm going to call ayush and harsh for the wonderful session let's have some fun activities let's have, see what the guys have hi hi hope we are we are going to enjoy a lot yeah hi definitely hi hi everyone yeah. hello so yeah we hope you had a great uh, great time looking at this amazing keynote and two awesome sessions so harsh what do you think about planting your new develop cut us case what can we do hmm how about how about we do a quiz how about that how does it sound that's great that's great i mean we can do a kahoot quiz and the one who is on the top 3 are obviously the flatter experts right now in the chat so don't worry if you don't know how to play the kahoot we will surely guide you how to play it and if you are already aware how to play kahoot please know us in the comment so yeah let's do this let me share my screen so i hope everyone is able to see my screen right now yes yeah so if you want to join us to play the kahoot you can simply go to the kahoot.it which is given in the given in the screen and you can enter the game pin right now which is given in the screen which is 496834 so are you excited for this game yeah yeah i'm excited i'm really excited even i am new in flutter and you're teaching me flutter apparently ayush is my mentor and sure. let's see i'll also test my flutter skills let's see how i'm doing Yeah, and to be we honest, have uh, two players. Harsh, yes, Harsh is actually a tennis flutter developer, so he's also going to help you how to guess the answers while you are guessing the right answers in your mobile devices. So keep an eye on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I'll be playing Email with you guys as well. Yeah. Also, excellent. Uh, the speakers are not al- not allowed to play. Yeah, yeah. Let's. We also I mean, have some great, uh, amazing surprises for you, the for the winners. So give it all. Yeah, yeah. Twelve players now. Fourteen, fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's see how many we can get. Come on, everyone, join, join, join fast. We'll only wait for a few minutes, and then yeah. we'll start. We will start at. We will start at thirty-six. Eleven thirty-six. So please, fast. Come on, join. You only have two minutes. then you can say hi to dashlet i hope oh, everyone knows wow. this hi. right cool pretty cool, cool name right on a scrap rational glider i wish i wish let me ask you based on the names by the way they are random um who do you think who do you think will take the win I mean, the horse is the fastest. So I guess speed. I was the some speed horse. I guess the mm. one who has speed in it will obviously take the lead. That's my that's my take on this. You never know. What maybe think? maybe 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 he or she can you know if even if besides speed maybe they can answer incorrectly. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I'm gonna quickly yeah. incorrectly answer this question. <laughs> Hmm. I like. Let's see. Um. I'll I'll bet my I'll bet all my money on. Let's see. Friendly dragon. I always wanted a dragon. Who was a friend? Yeah. <laughs> so. Let's see. Let's see. I hope. Two days by the King of Thrones. Wins. Yeah. Of course. We have see, one more minute on, left. On, so if your friends are not joining, join yet. So you can ping them and say to them to join us. Yeah, uh, and I wish can you explain how the questions will appear on the screen and how the viewers have to answer? Yeah, so basically you will be seeing a question on the screen, and corresponding you will be seeing the four options on the screen. Now the option will have a particular color and a particular shape. 
in the mobile device you will be only seeing the shapes and the colors you won't be see we won't be able to see the question nor the answer so you need to remember the shape that you have seen on the screen and then click on the shape in your mobile device to give the right answer if your answer is right you will get some points and then there will be a leaderboard also also okay. the first one to answer has more points so be sure to be quick on answering but also as arsh mentioned don't answer the wrong don't answer the wrong yep 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 and listen to my answers i'll always be correct don't worry as i said i am a 10x flutter developer even though i'm still learning i'm a 10x flutter developer <laughs> That's awesome. Wow, 40 players. Nice, nice. Everyone is active. Okay. So I guess we will start the countdown for 10 to 0, and then we can start. Yep, yep, yep. And also, if you're winning, if you win the Kahoot quiz, please take a screenshot and tweet it out to us at India Flutter. If you're not on the Twitter, you can also mail us, which is indiafederate@gmail.com. Someone in the comment will be giving you the email address and the Twitter handle. Yeah, you can yep. see right now in the bottom. Yep, yep. Okay, so I guess we can start the game. I guess we have 46 players right now. Let's start. Uh, okay, I'm excited. Cool, cool. Okay, let's. Oh, 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 oh. Start. Okay, sorry guys, if you haven't joined. uh we are running late on the time so we need to start the game too okay so let's start so first question will be the demo question for everyone to know how the game is working cool who is known as mother of dash hmm interesting question harsh what do you think who is who is the right answer here um let's see um i think that it could be nikita Mm. Yeah, I guess because no. she gave us the dash dates right. Uh, last time we had the Flutter Interact party, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. But I'm having second thoughts as well. Maybe it could be Nila, or maybe it could be Emily, or maybe it could be Pooja. Oh, the right And, answer is Nila. Oh, so I was thank right. you for yeah. Thank you so much for letting us know who is the mother of Dash. So that's how we how we are going to play this game. So right now, I hope everyone knows how to select the options, how to see the questions and do things. And we will also have a leaderboard. The first question won't have any scores, so everyone will will be at the zero. Right now, inspired there, nice name. Okay. So yeah, now every question will have some points attached to it. So make sure to answer it correctly and as fast as possible. So let's start. Yes. Okay. When was the Flutter project unveiled? Okay. This is a nice question. I, what do you think? What do you Flutter, think? Flutter Live 2019. Oh. 2018 Flutter Live. I started with Flutter in the end of 2019, so it must be 2019. Um, I think that it's 2019. Yep, yep. What do you think, Ayush? Am I right or am I wrong? Let's see what crowd has to say. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. And it's 2017. 2017. Actually, wow. Maybe people have answered 2017. Actually, Flutter was unveiled in 2015, and the project was started internally in 2014. So yeah, you can check the Wikipedia too. Yeah, yeah. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I wish yeah. I had let you down. Nah, it's okay. No issues. So let's see the leaderboards. And who's Purple first? Purple B is leading. Purple B is first. That's great. And Purple Bee is leading by too many points. Majestic Sphinx, it's your time to shine now. Come on, let's do it. Next question, Ayush. What was the initial name of Flutter project? Okay. I guess hmm. Hummingbird. I've heard the Hummingbird many times. Hmm hmm hmm. I think that it could be Cloudy. Yes yes. The answer is Cloudy. I'm sure it's Cloudy. I can't be wrong this time. um it has to be cloudy what do you think ayush am i right or am i wrong let's see what order has to say i think it's sky 
Hmm, you think that it's sky? Let's see. I'm sure that it's cloudy, and oh, it's sky. My guys, you don't need to actually. forget. Yeah, we don't need to take us our answer seriously. We might be wrong. Nobody we might be right. So we need to decide. Nobody selected cloudy. <laughs> They don't trust you. Man. Okay, cool, cool. Let's see the little words. Oh, so we have social gecko. Social awesome. gecko and winged hen. Wow, social gecko is leading by a lot of points. Let's see, let's see what happens in the next question. Come on. What's the command used to check if there is there are any platform dependencies left for the setup? Hmm, hmm. I think I've seen this somewhere. Flutter nurse. Okay. Yeah. That seems very interesting. Okay. Flutter setup because it is related to setup. I guess it would be flutter setup or flutter dependencies I because both has anything. I think the options are wrong. What? I think that it should be, it should be Flutter Doctor is what I meant to say, and it is okay, Flutter okay. Doctor. See, I'm right. Yeah, thank you so much, Cloud, for helping us to find out the right answers. Yeah, let's see the leaderboard. Uh, and social, social gecko is still on the top. And social gecko is on a fire. That's great. That's great. Let's see. Let's see what happens in the next. Next question. And the next question is: It's a true or false? Does Flutter have a release support mode for Windows? Hmm, true or false? Actually, I think that I know the answer to this question. And I'm not gonna say it, of course, because if I say it, then people will start answering my question. So that's why I'll keep it a suspense. I'll say it at the last second. and the answer is answer is true so those wow. of you don't know uh, flutter has recently added the release mode support for windows and linux too so if you are a linux and windows developer you can check it out it is available in the master branch okay. no it's thanks, not false thanks. i guess yeah thanks avish and let's see oh blue elk has taken the lead and fearless nail is right behind blue elk let's see what happens in the next question another two or false does dart support null safety features wow um we just talked about this andrew yeah okay, i just talked about this in our live session yeah so if you're watching if you're updated you will definitely know the answer to this question i know the answer to this question as usual i know the answer to every questions on this planet not just flutter i am a 10x person i am a 10x person we don't doubt that let's see <laughs> answer is true okay okay guys the flutter the dart does support nice safety features right now and you also talk about it and also keynote we also had the host talking about it in the keynote so yeah let's pay more attention during the sessions Let's yeah yeah come on and fearless nail fearless nail has taken, has taken over blue elk that's great that's great blue elk come on you need to win come on come on radiant turtle come on step up step up come on which recently added widget enables pan and zoom interactions with its child wow this is so a tough question new. to be honest it's a new widget it's new widget which is available only in the master branch right now i see that's very interesting because i know that some of these are old widgets i've used a few but i don't know what could be the answer how out of course i'll wait till the last second and then i'll answer and answer so is so the selected interactive viewer is correct the this is the new widget which is added right now in the master branch by the federal team So, if you want to zoom or zoom or pan uh, your child widget, you can do it easily. Before that, you have to do many of uh, many of things to achieve that kind of thing. So, you can check out this in the master branch. We will also uh, send the link to the documentation of it. 
that's great that's great and let's see oh fearless snail still on the top tough round only eight eight players lost their answer streak okay Ash, let's go which is the latest stable version of flutter available i know the answer to this question and the answer is uh flutter wow. 2.0 sounds great actually i am shocked because i was going to say 3.0 but uh, seems like there is no such option so now i'm confused i i was i'm sure it was 3.0 man come on what happened with me i don't know let's see let's see what the actual answer is and the actual answer is 1.7 1. 1. yeah that's great that's okay. great that's great let's see who is the leading and radiant turtle, radiant turtle has taken over here let's come on that's come on great. that's great ninth question which property is used to locate the position of a widget in a tree hmm, what do you think we had discussed this so many times right now in the flutter day chat also and right now with the andrew also so i guess people might be knowing the answer wow i wish you just surprised me all the time <laughs> you just say that everyone knows the answer but i am the only one who does not know the answer to this question let's say let's say hmm, what the answer is and the answer is build context yeah. yes yeah of course so I guess Andrew. you should, yeah, you Andrew should thanks Andrew that. for, yeah. Thank you, Andrew. And so, yeah. Yeah, Snail is back on top. Wow, that's great, that's great. And I believe which function is used to inflate the given widget and attach it to the screen? Wow. I mean. I guess it's build, build method. Hmm, I don't know. Is there is there is there any option called select all because every every option seems a great option to me right now but I am going to go with paint I think the answer is paint yes the answer is paint I know the answer is paint let's see hmm, what the, see. Let's say. Um, run app. the answer is run app actually okay so oh, you don't have to believe every answer we say it's the run app actually. I meant to say run app, but my tongue slipped. Actually, I'm sorry. Everyone have disappointed. My tongue slipped. It's not my fault. Let's move on <laughs> to the last question. If I'm not wrong, Ayush. Yes. So before we move on to the last, last question, question, this is a this bonus is a question, question for those. This is a bonus question for those who attended this session from the beginning. So you might be knowing the wow. answer to this. Wow! 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 This is that's just great, a bonus question for you guys. So if you want to come to the top, this is the last time you can do it. Okay. Which one of these did not host the keynote for Flutter Day India? Oh, you definitely had to. Let's see now. Hmm. I know the answer to this question. Of course I do. I think, I think it is. You think that it's, what is it? it's, it's, it's not the, no, it did not <laughs> host. Actually. Yeah. Hmm, that's very interesting. Hmm, hmm, it. Hmm, hmm, hmm. You can see it. Okay. Okay. Uh let's just the answer is yes. Seven people were correct. Seven people nice. were correct. Okay. And now I think the tables have turned. Let's see who's at the top and the final winners of the Kahoot quiz. Please take a screenshot. Yeah, and please take a screenshot of this. Fearless snail. And number two is bright ant. Snail and ant. That's great. Who's number one? Blue elk. Congratulations. Congratulations, everyone. Everyone. So, yeah, well you need to take a screenshot. Yeah, don't forget to take a screenshot and email us. Uh, or you can just go on the Twitter, post about it, show off on the Twitter that you have won the Kahoot Challenge and tag us in it, Direct India Flutter. Okay, so I and hope you had an amazing time for you. Yeah, you will be getting some awesome surprise. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Let's move on to the next.
session. I believe Max is coming, right? Yeah, I guess it's Max. Max is going to extend, take the next session. Wow, that's great. I'm excited, actually. Let's see now. Thanks, Harsh and Ayush, for such a refreshing <laughs> game. We hope you all have enjoyed it, as do oh, I. Thanks, Praful. So, coming to our next speaker, let me introduce Max Weber. Hey, everyone. Welcome, Max. Namaste. What? Thank you. Namaste. Hope you are well. Yes, I do. <laughs> so, talking about Max, he's a full stack developer and he start, and he's also a traveler. And True. he started his journey with Flutter in 2019 at Google I.O. In 2020, he started his own YouTube channel named Flutter Explained. Do, don't miss the chance to check, check his out his channel because he really has some awesome content uh, covered on Flutter. Today, he will be sharing how to skyrocket your application performance with the background task. Exactly. <clears throat> so I will just start, I think. So hello, everyone. Welcome from Germany here. And yeah, I have the pleasure today to introduce you. Yes, OK, sorry. I uh, was uh, interrupted by the chat. I will try to take that away so that I don't see anything. So here we go. All right, and I want to introduce to you today how you can use background tasks. And what I will explain is the isolates, how isolates work in the first place. And then we will switch to a more deep dive into background tasks, how they are working. And I think uh, Andrew had already the possibility to explain a little bit what are the problems with background tasks at the moment and why they are so important for us. So I will just start and I will begin with myself a bit. I heard already a lot of things like I'm a traveler. Yes, I was last year on world travel. In the meantime, I'm always a software engineer. We call me consultant, trainer, public speaker from now on. It's something new for me. So if I'm a bit shaky or I do something wrong, please let me know that I can improve myself. Um, and as um, already mentioned, I am uh, founded this year the YouTube channel Flutter Explained, where I'm um, preparing with my, uh, with my partner, Machtab, uh, very good content for Flutter, or I hope at least that it's very good content. But now let's take a look into background tasks. What do I mean with background task? I mean with background task, a long running task besides of Flutter. So it is behind of the Flutter scene and we can't see it. Your app is currently not active, but performs the task. So you close down the application, like I'm doing here on the right side now. So you can see this is a background state that I'm calling in background or still active. And now we have closed the app completely down, but we want that background is still the task performing. So what does the Dart and Flutter framework delivers us to achieve this goal? Well, there is one big keyword called isolates. If you have never heard about isolates, they are own contained um, Dart um, instances that have their own event runner, their own event loop, their own event uh, allocated memory. And this has a very big benefit because with that, we have an own separated con uh, instance that runs their application. And we have the possibility with messages to send back and forth information. And this is running completely in the background. And we will have, uh, or we will see later, that it has one disadvantage for our use case. But let's start right away. How would we do that? So I give here a short overview and don't get overwhelmed by the graphic. We will go one by one about it. So we will start with the main isolate. So Flutter is running, of course, in a Dart isolate, which is the Dart Flutter engine at the end. And we can see it has um, what we will create is a main receiver port or a receiver port. And you can imagine a receiver port like a post box. So you drop something in and you can take it out. So whatever is in that main receiver port later will be used by the main isolate. Also, we will create a second receiver port. We will call that response port. So there we go all the uh, messages that we will get as a response. Then we will connect the main isolate and the child isolate by spawning first the isolate. We will create that later. And then we will send more or less the, uh, the delivery man more or less with the uh, receiver into the child isolate. And with that, 
the child isolate creates its own receive port, <coughs> receiver port, and send it back to the main isolate. And with that, we have connected these two um, isolates together, and they can send now messages back and forth of that. And what we can see on the right side is we have will also create a response port. And we'll send here the delivery man to the child isolate, and it will send the information back to the main isolate. OK, but this is now a lot of words. And I want to give you just an overview before we start with some code. And I have to disappoint you, maybe, because I will not live code, or at least not yet. Maybe, in the, maybe if we have some time at the end, I will do some live coding, or I will start up something. But till then, we just have everything on the screen. So let's start easy. We will need a stateless widget, or I did it now in a stateless widget. We can do it, of course, also in a stateless widget. But because we want to keep some state, I created an isolate for that. So here we have the init state function, and I create the isolate. <clears throat> and what I'm doing is, at the end, I call this function here. And as you can see, I told already that we create these receive ports. And these receive ports are our post box, right? So we have here our main receive port which then be the post box for our main isolate. And in the second line, we await till an isolate has been spawned. So we create our isolate in that line of code. And what we are doing is we pass through an isolate method. And this isolate method has some parameters. And I will show you that in a second. But what is important is we don't call it actually. We just give it into the spawn function and let that handle to call that function. And we have the possibility to send one message into this isolate method later. <clears throat> and if we take a look into the isolate method, that is a static method that lives somewhere in our main, or it can be, uh, the only problem is this one can't be a part of a class if it is not static. So it needs to be a first class citizen. <clears throat> and now we are sending from the main receive port, the send port inside. So you can see down here, we get in the isolate method a parameter called send port, main send port. This connects now the main isolate with the child isolate. And we create for the child isolate its own receive port. And the receive port is created here. And now what we are doing is we are sending the uh, main send port, the child send port back. So if we take a look once more at the um, screen slide, whoops, sorry, here. We can see we have now established this line here where we have that connection between the main isolate and the child isolate. <clears throat> All right, so that's good. But at the moment, we just have created two Dart or we have one Dart instance where our Flutter is running in and a Dart instance that doesn't do anything. So let's make some living inside of it. So for that, I want to call um, an API, in that case, the random user API, to receive two users and put that in the, uh, to a list, or in our case, print it first. <clears throat> so how did we do that? We called as new, <clears throat> we called this uh, send port from the child here in by getting the first element that is inside of the stream of main receiver port. So we get our, we open our post box, take out the first isolate that we find, and <clears throat> That is the send port of the isolate send port. That's perfect. So with that, we can go further. But now we have to create, or I created a second uh, receive port, which I called the response port. <clears throat> and with that, I want to receive all the informations that the child finishes off. Now I'm calling the send port, and I send a message down there. And a message can only be one parameter, and in our case, it is an array an array of a string, which contains our um, API call, and the send port, where we want to get the answer to. <clears throat> and as you can see down here, we are calling the response port dot first. And with that, we receive the first message that comes down into this response port. If we take now the isolate again, and we take a look here, because the isolate <clears throat> or the isolate receiver port is also just a stream, we can wait for it and then execute the for loop. So we take the first message that arrives into the isolate receive port and put it into an element. And now, because we have this array here, we can access the indexes, for example, zero to get the URL and one to get the reply port, so where we want to answer to. 
Mm, I see right now that you can't maybe see anything. So maybe this is a bit better. So we have the first element that gives us the URL and the second element, which gives us the reply port. Now we make our HTTP call. Obviously, this URL with two users is very small. If we want to do this isolate, we would use that for 5,000 and more users, which I also did just to check uh, if it is working like I'm expecting it. And the performance has really a boost from it. And then down here, we have the reply port where I send it back as a JSON decoder. So this JSON decode can take a while because the JSON is pretty big from that user. And then we send it all back and we get our information where we need it. OK, that was, of course, a lot of code. And I think a lot of you are already confused. So what do, should I do now? And how should I handle now all these requests? And if I want to have an isolate? Well, Flutter would not be Flutter if it doesn't care about their developers. So what it has is the compute function. And what you can see on the right side is actually the same thing like we did before. So we have received data. We call a function here. We get a list in that case now, and we await for the compute, where we call the compute method inside with a parameter. And inside of that, we get the parameter again. We talk our response and JSON decode. So you can use that, or you can understand that compute as a helper function for you to initialize easier um, isolates that work in background. It is pretty helpful because you have less boilerplate and you don't have to completely un uh, completely work uh, work all the time with that send uh, with that receiver ports and make them back and forth communication by the messages because it will always return a value which you can see here which is even inside of the so the isolate method is actually this one and you can see it returns something that we later can use in our list when we set state but as you can see also it is Maybe a very good helper function, but it's not that powerful like the uh, isolate because the isolate is well very much bigger and has more functionalities around it. And by sending the messages back and forth, we have the possibility to <coughs> sorry, uh, we have the possibility to increase here the uh, feature set. <coughs> so isolates are fine. They work in the background. They improve the application's performance. It can take the uh, heavy calculation tasks for us. And it allows multi-threading in Dart, which is fantastic. It is nearly exactly what we want. And it can speed up our applications. But there is one problem with that. Whenever the Flutter activity is getting destroyed, which happens, for example, if you press the back button on your, app, uh, on your phone, then the Flutter activity is getting destroyed. And we lose, unfortunately, every context to our isolates. They're getting destroyed, too, because the uh, Flutter engine is getting shut down. OK, so this doesn't solve completely our issue. As long as we keep it like in background state, it could work. It is a bit of luck, but it doesn't be sure that it works. So I called it now app suspended what now? So this is our question. So now if I'm closing off the application and I want to have a background task that is performing all 15 minutes, for example, a task, we have to find a very good solution for that. And one solution is to call a plugin. As Andrew already mentioned to, uh, to today, um, we have to write some platform native code that allows us to start up a Flutter engine and runs our Dart code after that. So for that, we would use the um, we would use, for example, the channel methods to get the information passed to the Kotlin code. And from there, we execute Dart. The downsides of that is it is super code heavy because we have to identify all the places where we want to call that. And we have to write native code, which is maybe not pre preferred by a lot of people. So we have to do, leave our Dart comfort zone and going into Swift or Kotlin which is also not bad, but it uh, creates a barrier, right? And the worst problem, in my opinion, is that we don't have so much documentation. So there are this nice little tree. And as everyone that is interested in background processes, you will come to that page. And I found two important things. Number one, it is a package and plugins part. So we, this tells me right away that we will not come around to write some native code. And the other thing is the article from Penconi who created this geofencing with Flutter plugins. The problem with that, this article is super long, super hard to understand, especially with that geofencing, which is also like another topic for itself. So it is very hard to grasp the real background things that you really need at the end. 
And for me, the only key set that I found was the isolates model. So I thought, okay, let's start with that and jumping right away into it. So after a lot of research, I found some parts that I would use for my use cases. And I was really happy with that. So for that, I started with the background behavior. I wanted to understand how Android and iOS is handling at the end the background tasks. And what I figured out is that, for example, Android has a versatile tool set of different possibilities to handle these background tasks. So like Alarm Manager, Job Service, Firebase Job Dispatcher, and Work Manager. And all of them seem to work fine. So as soon as I have access to the application or to the Android source code, I can execute all of them and try to trigger my Flutter engine so that I can run Dart code. On the other hand, we have iOS. It has a minimum background fetch interval. This is a, a property that we can set. And with that, we can tell iOS, please, somewhere in that time frame, we would like to get some resources to execute our code. Obviously, both of them are very restrictive, even the Android and the iOS. So you can't tell them to execute every second, for example, uh, a task. This is not possible. But both of them give you the possibility to execute uh, every 50 minutes uh, at least once code, as long as it is not dangerous for the device itself. So if you take a lot of memory or you take a lot of internet activity, it could be that both um, that both uh, I, uh, systems will not allow you to execute your code. Okay, but that's fine, right? So, but now how can I solve my problem, right? I still want to have some background tasks. And for me, after I worked a lot with the GitHub repositories, with the examples and so on and so forth, and I tr tried to get my head around how I can communicate with the plugins and also execute the code, with, which then calls the Flutter engine, I found something from the community who guessed it, the work manager package. <clears throat> And I really have to say this was a, a full solution for me. First of all, I found nearly everything that I wanted inside of that work manager package. So I highly recommend you, if you are interested more deeply in that topic, how it is connected, just take a look into the work manager package and identify uh, inside of the GitHub repository how they are connected. So if you want to write it yourself, this is your place where you find most of the documentation at the moment, I would say. Then you have the possibility because the work manager package facilitates the Android work manager with the iOS perform fetch with completion handler. Completion handler. <clears throat> so you have the possibility with this work manager package to access the device, underlying device, with some plugin code to access all these two methods and it will execute your um, source code right away. The benefit, it has nearly no installation effort. So you can really just jump it in way. In Android, it is really just one line that you have to check if you have a, the actual uh, newest version of Flutter. You can use it anyway right away. And you don't have to provide any native code in Kotlin or Swift. That was for me like, uh, yeah, the best thing that I could happen because, well, I don't want to spend so much time in writing plugins. I wanted to just use a background method and wanted to execute it. <clears throat> So, but how does it work actually? So how do we code that? As you can see here, I use the work manager initialize in any method. In that case, it is the main method. And what we are doing is we register a callback dispatcher. This is working the same way like it would be for the background task. So if you take a look into the documentation and that Medium article, you will find also this callback dispatcher wording, which is nothing else than something calls back to the application or to the Dart code as soon as the um, the underlying plugin re-triggered the build of the Flutter engine and executes the callback dispatcher. The second part is is in debug mode, which gives us a very nice and convenient way to see if our tasks are actually running. That is perfectly fine, and I will show you in a second why this is important. But um, just keep in mind that this flag exists and you can put it on true and false, or you can even do it by release mode, of course, which I would re uh, recommend to you. And what we are doing next is we are defining a task that we want to execute. And we have here one task that I added. It's the register one-off task, which is just a task that as soon as I'm uh, in the app and I started that up, I have register one-off task. So it will be running. And after that, it will automatically dismiss itself. 
So dispose is actually a problem because if you have, like I had in the beginning, a periodic task registered, which is a task that occurs all the time in a 15 minutes interval or something. So in an interval that you define, but it can't be lower than 15 minutes, then you will get like a lot of notifications because after a while it sticks up and I had like three apps where I tested it around. So after that, my notification bar was full of different tasks that I executed. And I needed to search all them differently and had to execute, uh, uh, dismiss them uh, one by one. But uh, yeah, just to keep that in mind, there is something that you have to do. After that, you have an ID. This needs to be unique for this task. So uh, there can't be two of the same IDs that would lead to a crash. Um, so I would recommend you to use the UUID package to create this ID here. The second part is the task name, and this can be multi used multiple times, and it will define which method or which execution of ta task will happen after the task is finished. And the second part is the initial delay, which um, it has way more than these attributes, but I have focused on the initial delay and the input data. So initial delay, just to explain it, is just the time that it will take from the beginning when the task is registered to the device till it is really executed. And the input data are all the data that I want to pass down to that method that we will execute in a second. OK, so now I talked already about the is in debug mode. And I created here also a sm small video where we can see that the work manager setup is creating me exactly this um, callback as soon as we are calling it. And you can see in that case, it is a success. We got that after the 10 second frame. And we can see also the input data, which uh, contains our map that we uh, passed down. And that is everything that we can use and need to have the background tasks running. So you can really debug them and see when the timings are, what are your results for your method, and so on and so forth. OK, so now the callback dispatcher. And this is actually your isolate. And why I'm saying this is an isolate, it's very important to know this can't be part of a class only if it is in a, st a static method. But this callback dispatcher, and if we remember, I just jump once more time back, the callback dispatcher is directly initialized inside of the work manager that we use. All right. So this method executes again the work manager with execute task. And now we will receive the task name and the input data that the callback that from comes from the Kotlin code is, or from the iOS Swift code, is getting a callback here with the task name and the input data. In that case, I'm doing not so much. I'm just executing the task name and take a look what are the input data. And after that, we have to return value true, and it needs to be a future because that is what the execute task wishes. But with that, we have now the full power of our device. We can run background tasks, and we can be executing everything like we wish to. And that is really amazing, because with that, we have finally the option, for example, to run background tasks like a pedo tracker who checks our steps that we are doing. It can create a geofencing, like is in the blog article. It can create all the cool stuff with the background task that we want. How can this solve our performance problems? Well, it can increase, uh, make the background uh, calculations, for example, for us uh, in the meantime, while the app is not really running. And that is pretty cool, as long as it doesn't take too much memory or too much network space. OK, so let's come to a conclusion. And I'm thinking I'm pretty good in timing. So let's talk about the conclusion. So we have an isolate. And the isolates help us with improving the app's performance in general. But we have to be careful because the isolates are a very powerful tool where we can write a lot of code around it and we can over engineer it, which means we will try to put everything into an isolate just because it is fast. But then we will get the downsides that we have maybe multiple isolates that we have to manage. And Flutter is already very power, powerful and fast. So we really have to have a very good reason to use and isolate. And as always, first get the performance issues and then fix them. OK. The second part are the background tasks. And the background tasks have for iOS and Android different, very different approaches. Both are not really flexible. So you have to keep that in mind if you do your calculations and everything. And the last part is from my side, 
I recommend you to use a package at the moment because smart people have already created very cool solutions for us that we can use all the time. All right. So in the last part are just my resources where I was working through all the different parts. I will. Um, I think the Flutter India community will share these uh, slides with you. So I will not go one by one through them with you. And so thank you very much for joining us today or me today. It was a fantastic to talk with you. I really hope you enjoyed the talk and see you the next time. Thanks, Max, for this great session. I hope the audience has gained a good knowledge from this. Uh, now, uh, there are some questions from our audience which I would like to be answered from you. Okay. Like, uh, what are the like good uh, testing techniques or what uh, what good code structure do you follow? So, can you please uh, speak something on that? Mm -hmm. Which code structure I'm follow? Well, I'm trying to separate concerns as much as I can. Um, I'm there in the minority, I think. So uh, that means trying to separate all the different parts like UI and trying to get all the system logic into other classes and places. So I'm trying to separate that a lot. Um, it makes it easier to test, but a lot of people also say Flutter is fast enough, just put everything in the UI. I'm not sure about that, but it works, yeah. So, um, but for me, I really like to work with provider or now with the new river pod. I'm trying there around state management wise. So I try everything a bit, but as uh, Andrew also said already, there is no right solution for state management. Uh, my first applications, like the first three, were all with set state and it worked perfectly fine. So there was no mistake with that. Thanks, thanks for your time, suggestions. Max. You're very welcome. Okay, so I think uh, Yeah. Hey Max. Uh, hey there. How, yeah, how are you? Uh, very thanks. Good. Yeah, thanks for a really good session. And I think people are uh, really uh, amazed and they were really waiting for this session. I think even Andrew was waiting for this session. And I <laughs> I hope Andrew is saying it. Uh, so yeah, so there are a few more questions which uh, we would like to ask. So mm -hmm. one uh, question which one uh, viewer asked is, uh, so if you run a Dart code in background, mm -hmm. does it reduce some performance there? If you run the same code in foreground, um, probably it could be, that's a good question, depending on how the device is. If you are running it anyway in a plugin and you know about Kotlin and, Dar uh, and, and Swift, it is probably a good idea to also use it directly there. It is just if you are feeling more familiar with Dart and you say you don't have any problems by calling the Flutter engine and then setting it up, you will have some boilerplate, of course, which could lead to a small performance reduction, but I think it depends highly on which task you want to perform at the end. So if it is just a minor thing that or a big thing, but still minor enough to run it in Dart, no problem. But if you really want to twerk out every performance out of it, I think the plugin code will be the best option for you. Uh, got it. And uh, so, uh, what about uh, so you talk like there are multiple uh, ways in which you talk about for using uh, the background mm -hmm. uh, which one which one do you usually prefer for your apps mm -hmm. well um i'm started with that topic and i really wanted to try to grasp first the ident id what happens behind right so uh, the isolates is of course the best option if you don't want to interfere with uh, plugins or getting into software code inside of the different devices and you don't have to write the code multiple times but for everything else, as I said already, the work manager is for me at the moment like the way to go, just because it is very easy and convenient to work with. And I don't have to care too much with the, um, with the system code. And another benefit is I can even write the tests inside of Dart. So that is very cool. So I can execute the calls on in the callback dispatcher. It is just a method, right? So we have multiple methods in the worst case, and I can really test them. Oh, got it. So uh, lots of so you are a fabulous uh, YouTuber. Uh, you are Thank making you. so you are making so many uh, good videos. So lots of people are asking like if they want to start uh, with a you know uh, a coding YouTube channel, a programming YouTube channel, how they can start with it. 
Oh, if they want to start with it, uh, first learn the foundations. I, I started last year, or actually I started 2011 with the Flutter YouTube channel, so with my YouTube channel, where I created like first Let's Plays and I really tried a bit around. It was horrible, the content was horrible and I really didn't like it. Later we made some uh, traveling videos, which getting a bit better. So you, you really have to just start, make some videos. In the first place, they will be all horrible. If you take a look into my streams at the beginning, they were just mind blowing bad. You will get a confidence in everything that you do if you uh, do it long enough. And for basic tutorials and doing something, maybe start with something that you really are familiar with, what you like and what you really want to do in YouTube. And the second advice is don't give up, right? Because it is so hard to be successful on YouTube and everyone who started a YouTube channel, the first 100 followers are like horrible hard. After that, it's getting even harder because then your goals are increasing, right? And even now with, I mean, I'm still small with 2000 uh, subscribers. Thank you to everyone who's following. I'm uh, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so even with 2000, it is still hard because now we are starting to, okay, we have 2000, they want something from us. They want to have good content. They they really are convinced that we are doing a good job. So how can we keep that up and how we improve that from point to point? So it is really, yeah, it is, is really a lot of feelings with that thing. And it's like our passion, our heartbeat at the moment. We love Flutter, I love Flutter. And I think most of you see that. And I really hope to bring that over with my YouTube channel. So what can, what can be the new videos uh, we can uh, see from the Flutter Experience channels to be coming up? Yeah, so my new videos, and there are a lot of them, um, are planned. So for example, I still want to do all the state management plugins, which will take a lot of time because I will really want to understand them before I'm talking about that stuff. Then uh, the background tasks is one thing that I want to go more deeper into it, maybe writing some plugins with the community. And I started now as like live stream session with my partner and that will be also still a part of which we will do in the future more and more often and all these stuff. So we have a lot of projects. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what was the, what was the turning point for you, Max, uh, after the Google IU 19? How made I mean, how made you start? The, how made it uh, happen to you? I mean, yeah. How you started it? Yeah, I was coming from a web background completely. So JavaScript, TypeScript, Angular, React, all this stuff was my home. And I was always like, OK, it's good enough. It works. It's perfect. Uh, I can make CSS. Everything looks beautiful after I have invested a lot of hours. But the only problem is the underlying um, like basement or foundation of it. And when I heard that Flutter Web would be a solution that I can really write web applications in a typed language, in a strong type language, it was like a mind blowing a moment for me because I thought, yeah, exactly this is what I want. It is not that I have like JavaScript that could be anything. And it has also the downsides for me that uh, I have to explain always or I'm like a teacher and tutorial giver, right? Also in work. So if I'm a work consultant or anything, then I have to explain, for example, what is TypeScript? How do you use it, for example, if you want to have typed system in JavaScript? And the worst part of that is people can use JavaScript in TypeScript. So they mix everything together. It gets like a huge bulk of mess at the end. So my hope is with Dart that we can get rid of that. And with all these typed things that even CSS is typed somehow, that is like a really big advantage for me that I saw. And I was like, it has hot reload. It is faster than Angular or anything else that I'm working with. It is just beautiful as a code wise when I'm coming from a full stack perspective. And it's also easier to explain to everyone because the IDE is telling you, you make something wrong, right? So if if this not helps you, what else? So from my perspective, this was really the turning point where I said, Let's go Flutter full full fledged. <laughs> yeah, so I was a native Android developer too, and when I saw Flutter for the first time, and I was like really amazed, like wow, how easily Flutter is doing stuff. Like uh, remember, how, like how hard is it to you know make a simple list view or uh, uh, recycler view in Android, and which is really easy in Flutter. And you know, you know maybe with the animations like Hero Widget, it's so easy uh, to with, do with the Flutter. True. That's uh, really a bit. So another question which we are having from the YouTube comments is from Preet. And he's asking, does uh, work manager swarm for our different isolates? 
That's correct. So um, yes, they are the different isolates, but it's always that callback function that we created. So it will create always this as an isolate, will runs into its own Dart system. So you will not be able to call, for example, other um, methods or information that you have from somewhere else. But you can test your um, callback function all the time. And as I said, you can also register different tasks for it, which makes a very powerful tool at the end. So um, yeah, it is an isolate. It runs in its own Dart environment. And that is pretty cool. Um, OK. So there are another few questions, uh, I think, which people really love to know about you. So which one do you prefer? Do you use VS Code, IntelliJ, or Android Studio? I get that question a lot, and especially as a YouTuber, it's pretty hard because uh, you can't do it everyone right. So uh, from my personal view, for bigger projects, I will always use JetBrain products. It's just a thing of habit. It's a powerful tool. It works perfectly fine. Uh, I learned over the last couple of years that there is so much opinionating about the different toolings that I started to learn both of them. So I'm working with Visual Studio Code. I'm working with Android Studio. I'm working with all the other products just that I can explain everyone uh, the right parts. And you know, it's it's always cool if you sit beside someone and say, hey, you could use a shortcut for that. And hey, there's this tool. You know, this plugin could also work. And th this helps yourself because you're getting better with both tools. You understand them if someone tells about them. And on the other hand, I'm thinking to be opinionated about a tool is like I'm telling you, I, I would prefer a hammer besides of a fork. It is both a tool for some purposes. One is sometimes better than the other. But to say something is faster than the other, there is yeah. some different approaches to it, right? So Visual Studio Code is faster in startup. I can use it very easily. It don't take so much resources. But why does JetBrains using these resources? Well, it gives you smarts and extraction methods, extracting of variables, and so on and so forth, that can't provide by, uh, by Visual Studio in that case. So yeah, I'm using both. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So you you, uh, you talked about you know shortcuts. So like I use lots of short uh, shortcuts in Android Studio. Like which one do you uh, mostly use? So I, in the Android Studio, I'm not sure if you use it. So mm -hmm. you can have multiple cursors in multiple lines yes. and type sure. at the same time. Yeah. So which one is your which one is your favorite? Mm -hmm. My, my absolute favorite, and if I want to stun workmates, it's always this multi carrots because it looks amazing if you write in six lines simultaneously. But my most used one is probably Command, uh, Command Shift A, which opens up the action menu and I can just type whatever I need, right? It's like a Visual Studio with the um, F1, I think, is the, is the code. And this is like bread and butter. You need it. <laughs> yes, uh, totally. OK, we have another question from YouTube uh, comments. So mm -hmm. what is the best thing you find in the river pot? And sorry, in river pot. Ah, um, yeah. well, the best thing is that it gets rid of the limitation, even though that a lot of people think that river uh, that provider didn't had limitations. It was just, I think there was a discussion about the um, uh, the uh, directional uh, data flow because it was like uh, not unidirectional, it was bidirectional. Uh, and now in river pot, this is not the case anymore, which makes it bit faster, it gets rid of some of the limitations. And I don't know if Remy Roslet, one of the like shining stars of Flutter, provides a new tool, you should try it out. It, it's really like that, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm always so amazed. I'm, I'm always so amazed how like how Remy can come up with so cool uh, packages. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's totally amazing. So okay, while we are talking about favorites, what's your favorite widget in Flutter? My favorite widget container, animated container. They are amazing. Ah. Love they okay. animated container is amazing. I mean, it can do everything. It looks always beautiful. You can change the constraints, the colors. It you can take some durations. Love it. Highly recommended to use. <laughs> okay, and what and and uh, in, like what YouTuber will you follow on YouTube for Flutter tutorials apart from you? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I have a lot of them in my list, and I think uh, one of them is in the chat. It's Pro Coach, right? He started with his YouTube channel. It's pretty oh. amazing. You can watch it all the time. It's pretty cool. Another one is Amateur Coder. He he started also in the same time with me right away, and we we always collaborate. Hey, how are your views going? How is you going? And it's still. We are like uh, on the same level at the moment, which is perfect because uh, it brings like a lot of discussion material into it. 
and then of course the big ones, right? Rezo coder. Um, I mean, it's, it's important to know. Then uh, Rim, um, Rody Davis has a YouTube channel where he makes live streams, which is amazing to follow. Uh, besides of that, of course, all the Flutter channels, Flutter India. I hear it's a very big channel that we should follow all along. <laughs> and yeah, so there are a lot of them, and uh, they are pretty amazing. At the end, they they can you really feel that they have experience, that they know what they are doing, and you if you follow them along, I'm feeling always a bit overwhelmed because I think ah I could do that better, and this is not good enough, and there is something to learn. But exactly this is what the YouTube is all about, and what the community is all about, right? Because Flutter, the community of Flutter is like, I have never seen or never felt something in that case in my life. Right? So I worked already in a Siebel community, which was also pretty good, but it was very stable and it, it was very, I don't know, static. But with Flutter, it's like, yeah, you do that. It's fantastic. Do it further. You know something, teach it to someone. Go in further. Yeah, File Stack is a very good channel. Uh, I read that right now in the chat. Yeah. Sorry, but yeah, it's also very important to mention. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there is one yeah, more question. The, yeah, yeah, well, uh, that. yeah, sure. Uh, would Dart have an optional constructor arguments? Like, for example, if there's an is error, uh, then then add a custom text style or use a constructor default uh, like that. So, would Dart have? Uh, I think we have already optional constructor arguments or what is the question i yes we have optionals but we have to make that named constructors i think then you can make them optional and pass things inside i'm not quite sure right now but i think that should be possible so yeah so there are totally three constructors one is the default one one is the named one and one is uh, the optionals one so with mm -hmm. the named ones you use curly brackets and with the optional ones you use the square brackets so yeah, I think we have uh, kind of uh, both of them, but yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, there are lots of new things coming with Flutter. So there's a viewer who is asking, like, how do you keep up with so many changes coming to Flutter? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that was exactly my question, and you maybe remember or seen uh, that I create sometimes these Flutter news where I just pull all the information that I get around, like medium articles, information from Reddit, from Twitter, and try to pull them together, and also check the GitHub master repository. And that was to, uh, exactly my question because I was overwhelmed by the stuff that comes in, and it comes in with a pace that is incredible, right? So we have a lot of people who are working on it, and it's very hard to keep up. And to keep up with that at the moment, I'm really searching the different channels, looking for people. For example, Tim Sneef is like the guy for a product. Uh, he's the product owner of Flutter, I think. So he will, of course, if he is publishing something, it is valuable for us and for everyone in Flutter. But on the other side, you have to follow people on Twitter like Chris Sells. Um, I think uh, Philip Hadjek is a very good resource, Andrew Brockton, all the big ones, because if someone knows something new, they will be the first ones to know, right? And and Max as well. Follow Twitter. <laughs> Follow Max <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so what about the uh, you know sound nullability which is coming? Uh, it's on Dart, uh, and what's your thought about that? Like you know, uh, lots of things are coming in uh, regarding nullability in Dart. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I took a look into the Dart roadmap, and I'm really happy that the dull uh, null safety is coming in because it takes a lot of resources and bundles them to one topic, right? And if it's getting released, the hope is that they also tackle the other problems that are in the Dart framework at the moment. So I'm really looking forward to see the Dart null safety check released and also try it out more in detail just to, to make sure that other languages that provided that already have a real advantage over Dart at the moment with that. But null, uh, null safety checks are fantastic if they are already prepared for us and we don't really have to care about them anymore. That would be really my wish in the future. So there's a question from Shara Yeah. Uh, yeah. What one thing that if I add uh, that can uh, prove a game changer for Flutter? Or uh, what you can I mean what a fellow, our fellow developers or anyone can add to the Flutter 
So it will make more better uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I think every issue that you can solve in GitHub repository of Flutter will be already a pretty much game changer because all of them are important. My personal favorite, and if you can do that right away, Tivari, would be if you um, finish off the problem with the images in Flutter web. Because <laughs> if you rotate an image right now, you get the container behind, you rotate the image, somehow it looks completely fuzzy. If you solve that one till tomorrow, that would be fantastic. And I can showcase it to my customers and go for it. <laughs> uh, thank you, like, Mike. It was a great QA with you, a short QA with you, which we did. And thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Uh, thank you. Namaste. <laughs> so, yeah, let's move forward. Uh, so let's introduce our next next speaker. His last, last but not the least, let me invite you to introduce Mr. Thomas Burkert. He is a Flutter developer as well as a Flutter influencer. He has influenced many people, many developers with his work. What he will be sharing today will make your life easier as a Flutter developer with the service locator library created by him. So please welcome Mr. Thomas Burkert. Thank you very much. Hi, Thomas. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, good morning from Germany. Um, actually, I'm really, really happy that I got the last slot so I could sleep a little bit longer. And um, yeah, it's the first time for me in the, on an online talk. I would really m much more uh, prefer to be with you in India. So I will just pretend the roaring applause that uh, is currently around me and uh, get me started. But uh, honestly, I got so much uh, nice feedback in front of uh, this talk that it makes it, um, yeah, I feel almost that there are people around me and that makes it much easier. Yeah, should we start? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the kindness, uh, Thomas. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can start. Thank you. Okay, so, um, okay. Yeah, this looks good. <laughs> yeah. Um, get it. Um, what is uh, uh, what is get it? Um, or why do I make get it? This here is just an um, example of an uh, app how I typically structure it. Um, it has three layers: uh, one for the uh, UI, uh, one for the business logic, and a service layer. And immediately you have the problem: how do I access the different objects from one from each other so there are different ways to do this we have uh we have the, the very first one inherited widgets then we have provider uh oh, oh, first let's start uh, inherited widgets yeah when i started with flutter uh about more than two years ago inherited widgets was more or less the only one that was there and uh Honestly, I was not able uh, to make uh, it update the right UI that I wanted to. It was just cumbersome. And I, uh, I maybe I did not try enough, um, but I heard from others that had problems at this time. Uh, so I just, uh, I thought maybe we could, can do it differently. Uh, we, can, we see this in a moment. Then um, Provider is currently one of the most used uh, solutions for this. Um, provider is, is nice. Um, what I don't like uh, on it that it's to access it and to, uh, to works. It has to be part of the widget tree, and it requires a build context. And uh, I wanted to have a solution that is completely independent of this. Um, uh, to be fair, Remy is cooking something new, uh, which was just referenced before: river ports that uh, removes this uh, requirement of the build context but uh, has some other things uh, that's uh, yeah, not, I personally don't like, but it's really much, uh, 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 with river pots there, I think it's a lot of matter of taste and uh, also what other functions we have. Yeah, and uh, before provider was uh, available and I had still problems with the inherited widget, I decided to port a service locator that I uh, was used to use on .NET, this, uh, which was called Splat, uh, to, uh, to Flutter or to Dart. And I called it Get It because that's what it does. It gets what you want. And uh, it's super fast. 
no context needed and it's easy to use. This was the, were the things that, uh, that I wanted to have. And um, after that, I did not look back. And so even after other uh, solutions came on, I continued with Get It and I got some uh, positive feedback from users. And so I, I, yeah, I um, started even to enhance it with new functionalities. So how does Get It work? Um, so the thing is, you uh, you need a get it instance, and um, then you have uh, in this find I use uh, I uh, talk a little bit uh, a moment later why I use uh, assign it to a variable. I assign it to a uh, global variable, and uh, at the beginning of your app you have some uh, need some setup function, and for example here I register a singleton inside get it. And um, it's an, uh, an interesting here to, to, uh, to see. I register it with a type, with app model in this case. And I uh, register a concrete instance, which is, an, um, is inherited from app model inside get it. So from this point on, I can uh, access to this object over the, uh, the parent type from get it. So, um, so it, this means instead of what we would do with an inherited uh, widget, we uh, just can do this here. And uh, as get it itself is a callable uh, class, we can write it even shorter, just as l app, the app model dot update, for example. So. Um, Get it is called a service locator. What does this mean? Uh, it references services that are referent, uh, registered before. Uh, you could also say it is a dependency injection, uh, which might, uh, might uh, um, sound a little bit strange because typically dependency injection, uh, your objects are passed in with the constructor to your uh, to the to the object that wants it to use, but in reality. The point of in, uh, de uh, de uh, dependency injection is inversion of control, meaning the behavior of another object is controlled from the outside. And um, we do this with a service locator too, because we uh, define in the setup what object will be used when you reference app model. So um, it is also a sort of dependency injection. So let's have a look, uh, a closer look. How does it? Uh, how? What can you do with it? We have different types how we can register uh, objects in Get It. Um, as said, you need an instance, and I very often I just assign the uh, this instance really to a global variable because it's just so much easier uh, and shorter uh, to access it in my app. And uh, typically, it's the only global, global variable. So um, it's, uh, it's not that bad that, as it might sound in the beginning. Actually, they, uh, some people now use an, um, another name for it. It's, they call it ambient variables. So as to say, it's, the, uh, it's, uh, it's something that's part of the ambient of, the, uh, of your app. But uh, if you don't like this, uh, you don't have to use it. Uh, get it itself is a singleton. That's why we have the instance. So you can also call all the functions with get it instance, or because I love uh, I, I like uh, privity, you can just use get it dot i dot, and then call the functions. Now, I said different types of registration. Um, we have. Uh, Register, uh, get it is more than just, uh, as you cannot only register singletons. You can also register factories, which means every time you access uh, an object uh, over this with this type, you will uh, get a new instance of the type that you register here because you register a factory method uh, in get it. And uh, the nice thing is, you can even pass um, pass uh, uh, parameters 
uh, when uh, every time you access uh, an factory over get it so you can um, it can change um, what how it behaves even more um, the most used uh, uh, version probably is register singleton which uh, yeah it registers a singleton that exists exactly one and you have to pass an instance directly uh, with the uh, register registration and um, the last one which uh, is also uh, sometimes nice to have is uh, register LASIK singleton, which means the uh, implement uh, the instance is not created at the moment of registration, but the first time you access this singleton. So that's the reason why we also pass um, uh, a factory function here. So. One of the effects that we uh, have the uh, we, we register uh, the, uh, the objects in at, at, at runtime is uh, that we can easily switch out implementations. If we uh, register them with an, uh, with an abstract parent class, we can uh, register different instance implementations. Um, so, depending on testing, you will get different objects when you access it over app model. That doesn't mean you have always to use an abstract class. You can also uh, register uh, concrete classes and use the same time uh, for the instance and for the, uh, for the regist registration type. But uh, I recommend most of the time um, do it this way because then if you really need to, uh, to mock it or you need a different uh, implementation, for example, this could also be different uh, ways of, um, of databases that you um, uh, that, uh, that you register uh, that, uh, that you want to use and you want to switch it uh, at, a, uh, at this type or different types of REST uh, backends you can um, in your init function uh, you can uh, register different implementations. Now some people say uh, it's uh, or don't like the idea that uh, you have to um, in in initialize, initialize the um, uh, the uh, the uh, the, um, the service locator, uh, or the, uh, you have to in, in initialize get it uh, when you're writing tests. So um, this is a way uh, that I recommend for uh, in this case. This means I uh, give my user manager um, parameters in uh, the in the optional parameters in the uh, constructor where you can pass in. Um, your objects that you want to use inside. So in your tests, you can directly pass here, for example, your mocked objects, and uh, then directly inside, I decide if, uh, I, if if it's not passed in, I use get it, and if it's passed in, I use the passed objects. So um, this is a helpful pattern. Um, but you don't have to use it. You can just call your setup functions at the beginning of your uh, tests and go from there. And you can always reset uh, the whole get it over the reset function to, uh, to clear every registration and register again. Now we have some things that make get it a little, yeah, something special, I would say. Um, this means we can register uh, objects Asynchronous. What does this mean? This, this means that uh, I, for example, uh, uh, I have a factory, and the uh, the function that creates the object or the factory has to be async. For example, maybe it will call a REST API to create the object. And um, in this case, I can still uh, register them with the async versions of the regist registrations. So you see, we have all we have again the um, the same. Um, why do I have one twice? Ah, okay. This was an <laughs> I forget the last one. Um, we have the factory and the singleton as async. We don't have the uh, lazy singleton as async because this doesn't really make sense. If I uh, have to do something async, and then um, it should only be done when it's used. And uh, to get the instances in this case, uh, I have to use the get async uh, function. 
and um, I have to await it because maybe the uh, the factory method hasn't uh, finished yet. But after uh, it has finished, I can also access it with get. So only the first time I have to use get async to make sure that the object is there. Or in case of the factory, I have always to, yeah, to use uh, get async. Why do I? Um, why is it important the the, the async registrations? Uh, typically, I have uh, a register in get it. Um, um, yeah, infrastructure of my app. This can be um, a, a business logic. This can be a service below, and uh, especially at, at startup, uh, often we have some async function. For example, I um, uh, yeah, either doing some some rest call. Um, accessing shared preferences, for example. And it's always a little bit of a hassle. How do I do it if I don't have any support for this? And uh, for this, I added some uh, feature in inside Get It that allows us to orchestrate the initialization. So um, let's take this example here. We have an app model. And this uh, depends on a database service and a REST API service and the config service. And additionally, the database service also depends on the config service. So um, you can just think a second about how, yeah, that could, would uh, get quite complex how to do this uh, without any help, especially if there are async functions involved. So. In this case, we register our objects. This is now a, uh, a concrete example how this would, uh, would look like. If I register an async function, uh, an, an async uh, creation function, factory function, and there are different ways how, how you could do it. This is the most verbose in the registration. That uh, it means you create your, uh, your object you call the async init function, and then re you return it. Uh, there, is an, there is an alternative that looks a little bit nicer, I think. This is that you uh, write your init function in this way, that you, uh, you, your, your init function returns at the end of it itself. And uh, by this, you can uh, you can do it like uh, like this here that you uh, register it and just call uh, rest service dot in it and uh, this works just fine. So um, and the, another the last uh, example here is for example if I have an external async factory function I can it do I can do it like this. Let's get back to the um, uh, to the orchestration. So the config service is the is the base one. Then uh, I have the the rest service, which was also has no dependency. Now, the register singleton async of the database service, it has an additional parameter called depends on, where I say, okay, this service here has to be completely initialized before this one gets initialized. And um, you can uh, even do this uh, if you have uh, here app model, for example, is not an async uh, um, object, but it depends on other services. So you can use register singleton with dependencies and uh, give it uh, the services that it relies on. And with this, you are sure that they are initialized in the right sequence. But how do I use this? It's in my app as a whole. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty easy. You wait for the end of the initialization, for example, on your startup page with a future builder, and the future is get it all ready. And this future completes when all registered services have completed. So uh, in case, uh, all, as long as it's not completed, you show, for example, here in progress ind indicator, and in case uh, th that it has finished, you replace the, uh, the the page with your actual page content. 
pretty, it's pretty nice. It, it clears, uh, it uh, makes your startup code much cleaner than, um, than, than it would be without it. So uh, is that all? No. As I said, we have the, uh, the possibility with uh, factories uh, that can get parameters, uh, which makes them very flexible. If the synchronization with the depends on <clears throat> does not really fit what you need, you can also do it manually. And in this case, uh, you have to signal that your, um, that your object is ready with the uh, signal ready function. It's uh, where you pass typically it just signal ready this, itself and uh, other services that need to wait at some point of the initialization um, can use the is ready and uh, this returns only after this service has finished. Um, then we have, um, yeah, this is something <clears throat> I personally haven't used it and I don't like it really, but a lot of users ask for, is it possible to register more than one object uh, inside uh, re um, get it with the same type. And so I added the possibility to register named instances. Then in this case, you don't access the um, ex ex access the object over the type, but you pass an, um, the, a name for the, uh, for the object to access it. Um, but uh, typically I wouldn't use it, uh, wouldn't recommend it because this is not compile safe, uh, not not uh, not uh, type safe in the way that it is if I pass here the uh, the type as a generic parameter. Yeah, some resources where you can find me, and uh, you can uh, where I yeah I actually I'm very uh, active on Twitter, so you can uh, typically find me there. Also, can you can ask questions. And on my blog, I have more information on the RX VMS uh, up, uh, app architecture I showed in the beginning. <clears throat> so um, yeah, and uh, I'm happy to um, to answer any questions. <clears throat> hi, Thomas. Hi. hi. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. So Devanshu is here. Devanshu, can you ask some questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 can you mute yourself? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Hey, Thomas. First of all, uh, thanks a lot for the wonderful session. And I want I to know. I was, I was not too fast. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, you were, you were perfect. So I want to know, like, uh, how was your experience giving this uh, virtual talk for the first time? I think this was your first time, correct? Uh, just again. Yeah, so I, I'm saying that this was the first time giving a virtual talk, uh, online yeah. talk. How yeah. was your experience? Um, actually, it was pretty good. But uh, as I said in the beginning, the, uh, yeah. uh, the main reason uh, was really that uh, I got so much positive uh, feedback from India. Um, and I have a lot of followers uh, from India. So uh, it it felt felt good. I I had one presentation uh, one year uh, one online presentation one year ago for the um, Flutter team over mm -hmm. the uh, over my RX VMS uh, um, architecture, and this was felt really weird because I didn't know anyone there. I had uh, no feedback at all, and so um, yeah, this time was different. I enjoyed it, and. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I think it was amazing, and you don't believe me. Like my Twitter is flooded with your uh, talks, discussion about your talks, and people are really uh, like, it's really great to have you there. So I want to know about two things. First thing is like, uh, you have I've read your blogs, and it's lots of your blogs. Uh, you have written lots of blogs in uh, uh, like Alex BMS. So yeah. uh, and people don't really know about it. So can you give them a brief intro what Alex BMS is and how is it you know different from others? Uh, architecture patterns. Ah, okay. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, okay. In this case, I um, I just go back to the, uh, wait. I, uh, can you, um, can you, can you add the, uh, yeah, exactly. I, um, Yeah, 
Um, the idea of RxVMS is that I have, um, it's an architecture um, which can be implemented actually with different uh, technologies. Um, but the idea is that I have, uh, I have the, uh, a layer of, um, <clears throat> or a UI layer. I have managers and managers, <clears throat> uh, you could, we could call it sort of, um, yeah, blocks, but uh, on a la larger scope. Um, as I understand, most people uh, define blocks for uh, very small pieces of uh, functionality. And um, a manager groups um, functionality based on uh, their uh, on topics. For example, as we have here, uh, this is an, um, a diagram of an app I was working some time ago. And uh, for example, we have here a user manager. Yeah? So everything, uh, every functionality um, that has to do with users will be in there, uh, business logic wise. Okay. Or we have, for example, an, an, uh, a manager that uh, that uh, uh, handles invoices. So we have I have everything in this way contained there. And then uh, I have another layer, uh, services. And uh, services is everything um, that deals with the outside boundary of my app. So, uh, for example, uh, databases. It can be a service outside. I ca it can be um, as here. It, it can be um, a hardware of the phone, the uh, GPS, and so for example. <clears throat> and then it's important how uh, how I um, uh, how I see uh, how they communicate with each other. So, um, from the UI to the manager, it only goes over commands. A command is something. It's, 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 uh, it's a very important point in, 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 in when I use it, okay. um, or, or function calls. Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, from the uh, from the manager to the database, uh, asynchronous calls typically uh, or streams. So um, the the thing to know is about a command. A command uh, ca capsules uh, uh, an, a function that should be executed. And it is it can be called as as a normal function exactly as a normal function from your UI from a handler, and the command itself is also uh, a stream. So uh, the result of the function that is called that is, that is wrapped in the command will be put out on the stream interface of the command. So you can on the one side listen to the command with a stream builder, for example, and call it from another place. So um, uh, the data uh, the, uh, the data flows always a call and then in this direction it gets back. Yeah, we, we never call from uh, from a manager to the to the UI. Got it. And uh, the nice thing of commands is uh, commands can capsule um, asynchronous functions, and then it gets really interesting because I uh, I call them synchronously uh, uh, up here in the UI. So it does not block the UI in any way. And uh, I just wait that the result gets output on the stream. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and this makes the, uh, I I personally think it's uh, it's the better solution than a block because uh, I, I really, yeah, I, I don't like the idea to call something to push a message into, an, in, 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 into, into a, a stream controller, yeah? Yes. Um, but uh, this way, I really I do a call, and then I get over a stream the result back. Yeah, uh, it's uh, in my opinion, it's much easier to understand actually. Um, a side effect is a command has an additional uh, stream uh, that outputs boolean variables telling me uh, is the command active or not. Yeah. So I can, for example, listen with an, uh, with another stream builder uh, to this stream. And display an um, uh, display a uh, progress indicator or not? Yeah, and at least it has a third stream where every exception that is thrown from the wrap function is put out. So I can listen, for example, from the init function of a uh, stateful widget to this stream, and if I get one, I can show a dialog, for example. And this is all. Captured in a command uh, in, in a command object. So uh, if you have 
understand once how it works, it makes uh, your code very elegant, yeah, and uh, very loosely coupled because it goes all over um, over streams where you listen, uh, where you can listen from different places um, and react to it. And uh, as it streams, you also have the possibility directly combine it with the power of Rx, for example, to combine with other streams and uh, and so on. So this is the, this is in the short for a short form the um, Rx VMS. Yeah, and I, I, might, I, might, I might do a talk another time with more details. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember I was talking to you that you can give on Rx BMX and streams a talk on that. But yeah, but you have so many great topics, even it was really confusing for us. So, okay, uh, for people who want to learn about Rx BMX, where can they go? Pardon? Oh, uh, where for, can they go? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on my blog, I have. Um, let me go again to the. Uh, on, my, uh, on my blog. Um, it's uh, I have an, um, an article series that uh, introduces the concepts. Unfortunately, I um, I haven't finished it yet. Uh, the series, uh, but all the important points, like commands, like uh, yeah, okay, get it. We we, we learn today. They are uh, explained there, and also and, and the structure itself. What is missing currently is an example app that uh, where, uh, that shows it uh, in a real app. But I uh, hope I can do this in the next time. And um, I would really recommend give Rx commands a try. You can use them with any, you can use Rx commands together with, uh, uh, with provider. You can use it together with, with get it and um, see how you, look, how, you, how you like it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. So there are just a few more questions which we got from the uh, viewers and from YouTube or from the Twitter. So yeah. one thing is, uh, although I know like uh, you are working on Rx BMS and get it, but still uh, there's a question which people are asking that which uh, state management uh, do you use and on your project on day to day basis? Yeah. Okay. Actually, the statement. Yeah. This is also, also always difficult. Uh, what is state management? State management uh, at all? Yeah. Um, uh, because there's a, a lot of misconceptions, I think. Um, yes. For example, um, also some people call provider a, a state management, but actually, provider itself is not a state management. Yeah. People um, are also confused with the dependence injection and state management. Uh, Exactly, uh, or, 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 or location, or uh, to, to, to get your object yes. located, yes. because provider is also a, a locator, yeah? It, it, uh, it gets it exactly as get it. Um, so the question is, for me, state management is the part uh, that um, uh, where I, uh, that handles an, how an input from the UI is processed to the part, to the output, yeah? And uh, and uh, and defines what is the state of the uh, of the app of the um, uh, of the app at the moment. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and uh, what I do use is uh, trust yeah, is R Rx commands. This is the Rx commands are, are my state management solution um, because uh, they capture and uh, the, they have the um, the current state. That get, goes into they they also they, they store it. You can you can always also retrieve the last value that uh, that was uh, was there, and uh, your UI reacts to it. So I don't use any uh, any separate uh, state management solution. Oh, but yeah, that's awesome. And for all those people who wants to know more about Alex VMS, so they like Thomas has already shared his blog with you. And we'll also share that link with you guys. And thank you, Thomas, for being actually, here. Actually, there is also an, a quite old talk that I did in uh, for uh, Flutter London on Rx VMS. Oh. Um, I can uh, share you the link afterwards. Yeah, sure, definitely. So we can share it with the viewers. And uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. Thank you for being us with us. It was a great having you on this Flutter India stage. And next year. Uh, we'll probably uh, bring you to India and have a great session on Flutter uh, India. 
this would be absolutely awesome. I really would love to uh, to travel. Yeah. To India. <laughs> so yeah, I think whole Indian communities want you to come to India, and you know they really love to meet you here. So like this would be really amazing. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Thomas. And now I would like to call Yash uh, and Poonam uh, from my team. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Thomas. Bye bye. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for giving the amazing session on Get It, and thank you Divyanshu for welcoming us. So I'm Yashulkar, and with me is Miss Poonam Jha. Hey Poonam, uh, your mic is on mute. There we go. Hi guys, Namaste from Flutter India, and Thomas, we really hope that your uh, first virtual talk could give you a good memory with us, because you added. A lot of charm in a, like charm in the event. We we couldn't really ask for more than this. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you so much, each speakers. I guess that was the most important thing that we could actually expect for today. A lot of celebration is ongoing this season. This entire week feels like a festival season for all of us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. She wanted to add something. Yeah, man. We actually had a pretty amazing speakers. So I would like to tell something like after the hack after the session. So okay. Bring up the speed. Okay. Um. Uh. So post this. Here we go. This is not ending like this. We have it, it's starting after five around five thirty, right, Josh? The hackathon. Yeah. Yeah. It's starting. At least we have some time for that. So it, it's more. one twelve, and we don't have. Yeah, we don't have much time, guys. um get uh, take a look at the flutter uh, hackathon website official website having the entire schedule and um, the themes and everything how you can uh, build your team how you can prepare for that thankfully you do not have this time couple of minutes only to brainstorm and think what you can make up this time but thankfully you have more time you can um, discuss with your team you can figure out what you can make better what beautiful things you can create out of that along with that uh, one of the community which is a part of flutter india flutter amdavad invited hack 19 winner devin joshi and debasmita uh, sarkar and they gave some amazing tips how you can actually prepare for the win in hack 20 so we would just ask you take a look at that and um, hopefully that would be helpful because after, after all it was for you all yeah so do check out that flutter hackathon website and yeah if you if you are yet to start if you have just started with flutter but it isn't that difficult to put your hands on to get your hands dirty give it a try if you think because it's been almost more than 2 hours that we were continuously speaking about flutter 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 if you thought that it is a lot of flutter talking around and i haven't tried what is this how you can how we can give it a try you are just a try away you are just an attempt away to start flutter and you will love that because this is one of the most beautiful thing entered in the tech world So guys, this hackathon is going for 27th and 28th June, and in this hackathon, like this hackathon, is going to start at 5:30. So you will get your, all your questions, all your the problem statements in the evening itself. So from there, you guys can start hacking. Then you have to do the voting system, and it will be set. Um, as for the yeah, one sec. Yes. So yeah. as for the announcement, like they are for Flutter India. So we have our social media. That is the Twitter handle. We have our YouTube handle. You can check the videos on YouTube. Okay. So we also have our social media handles. That is the YouTube handle and Twitter handle. On Twitter handle, you can post us. So as you know, we had a conduct a contest. Hashtag Ask Flutter India. It is no. It is not just ending for this session. You can also ask us the question in the future. And if you want any of the answer, Flutter India will be really happy to answer your question. We the whole yeah, Flutter India team we have all kind of developers from beginner to expert. So everybody will show you the answer. So thank exactly. you guys. And now, yeah, so I would like to welcome Aditya to give our thank you. Yeah. Aditya, yeah. another fellow from Flutter India team. Yes, as uh, as Yash uh, said that we aren't ending this Ask Flutter India now. We are just being the middleware to let the know reach to you and get your all questions answered. and we will try to do justice with all this for sure this won't be ending here because till the time flutter is alive your questions will stay answered and we'll it will keep getting updated because the speakers are getting their content up to date all the time aditya has something interesting to tell 
yes over to you uh, yeah so first of all i would like to come uh, welcome all our host on screen so uh, i think uh, can anyone allow uh, all our host has started uh, put your name again guys yeah so uh, i think we should uh, now like uh, move on for yeah yeah everyone everyone can come Please. So everybody is joining us. Yeah. 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 There is no wonder that we all are working professionals. We are working with different time zones and different kind of set of client. But it was all for each individual who are seeing us live or are about to see us post this event. We were all intending to do some good content delivered to you in a good way that you can understand, you can digest, and you can. you can be more confident that that is not the big thing that you can you can you know you need to put a lot of efforts to learn that so that was the only core intention that we not only we five on the screen available now but the entire crowd at the back stage not in back, yeah this time i can say back screen so everyone is with the sole intention to give the right content delivered in a right way we are fortunate enough and have the privilege that we can be the middleware that uh, who uh, the individuals who has contributed in flutter who has worked with flutter or who are promoting flutter with all their heart and head they are they were the strongest support that we could bring we could bring this day to you these five individuals has prepared a lot and along with their working uh, things nikita yes we cannot really forget few individuals definitely nikita and nile has been the strongest support that we can they were just yeah. a call away uh, um, for us we whenever we had we had some doubts because we are different set of minds uh, we are we all are different mindsets working with different different things different communities different crowds we uh, handle in our own cities but this time it was again the vasudeva kutumbakam thing we wanted to do it from flutter india but to for the entire world and so we six not only we six but that there are only set of 21 individuals who worked really hard who tried uh, uh, not not i won't say compromising but that was because that was entirely fun process for us bringing this entire day to you all of you so we we six all individuals we give you a big thanks and and definitely thanks guys let's say from all of us because we it was all for you and we it could we could not have done this so well your live comments were boosting us up that we were doing well and we can still do better in the next event uh, so next we have aditya with for our ending now yeah so okay friends so we have come to an end but it is just the start of the journey I would like to th thank our speaker, all of our hosts, and the whole Flutter India team for making this uh, session successfully. Last but not the least, I would like to thank on uh, uh, thank you on behalf of the uh, whole Flutter India team to our audience for showing us amazing support. Uh, without uh, without whom our event wouldn't have been so amazing. So thank you all and have a good day. And just uh, tweet our uh, tweet your experience. Yeah. Um, we would be super happy to get your feedbacks and uh, get all the thank you that you you gathered so far because that's all what will make us more confident and more stronger that we are doing well and we can do better in future as well. Do let us know; it will be very happy and overwhelming for us. So there is one small announcement that uh, since we have finished uh, the Flutter Day India, so the website that you can see of Flutter Day India it will be open sourced by today, by today evening only. And you can check out our website, the the repo. And if you need any help, if you want to contribute, you can show the the contributors in the repo. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you again. Keep fluttering and keep learning. Knowledge is power. Thank, thank you, everyone, yeah. and bye, guys. See you again. Bye. Yeah. See you again. Bye.